for the 9th of February to order. Begin with planning commission decisions for the 2nd of February, 2021. Anybody have any questions or uh, see a need for a call up today? Anyone, anyone? No, okay. Let's move to uh, legislative review. A uh, revision of policy 24, housing, fee and loo and outdoor dining requirements. Tim. Actually, this is Nicole's. Oh. <laughs> We'll pass off. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Tim's like, gladly. Um, so um, the memo in your packet um, addresses two revisions that we are um, looking to make in policy 24. Um, one revision being that we need to add a fee and lieu calculation into the policy and the second removing um, any employee generation requirements related, with, related to outdoor diet additional outdoor dining space. Um, so I'll address um, the fee and lieu section first since that's definitely the meat of this um, memo. Um, so right now in our policy, uh, we give an option for, uh, for projects that, that create or generate more than one or less than one employee um, because that doesn't equal one unit, we allow them to pay a fee and lieu. Um, what we have not been able to do is apply a fee and lieu to a, a development application that has that um, any le anything less than one employee generated because we do not we did not have a calculation adopted yet by the council. Um, we were you know researching methodologies and, and really making sure that the approach we made to this fee and lieu um, was was appropriate and good before we we brought it to you guys. And so um, before you today is an example or is really the not just the example but um, a calculation um, for fee and lieu that is based on. Um, what we discussed in a prior work session. Um, this is a fee in lieu that is based on the market affordability gap. The market affordability gap is the difference between um, what kind of the average home is selling for in our market, which of course is higher than we could have ever anticipated right now, and 80% um, AMI for a two-person household. And so that gap um, is adjusted for the number of employees per household and um, is uh, basically divided, I, we'll go into all the details of the calculation, but is um, uh, adjusted to be um, a square footage amount um, to be assessed per square foot of, of new um, area that's developed. So um, the fee in lieu is, uh, this methodology is used in a lot of communities, Vail, Aspen, um, uh, Durango, uh, communities like that. And uh, what's interesting is we looked at um, the cost of construction as well. And in all of these communities, even the ones that use cost of construction, they converted uh, to this market affordability gap because um, it is a much more, um, uh, I would say reliable number given that co cost of construction can vary and it's based on you know how many projects are done in a year. So um, this is definitely the standard methodology that um, uh, most communities are using. And so this amount, this fee in lieu, would only apply to projects that generate less than one employee. Um, this is something that um, we should apply so that we can en enforce this part of the policy. Um, having a number will, will make us be able to do that, um, since right now we are currently not able to do that. Um, the other uh, part of this is the outdoor dining requirement that we had put into the policy 24 um, housing requirements. Um, the reason we feel that we should remove this um, kind of stems from a couple of things. One is that um, we haven't found any other communities that are looking at outdoor dining space um, and when they're calculating their um, employee generation. Although we are confident that this does contribute to employ the need for employees having large outdoor dining spaces. Um, you know, our goal is that we would when we do an updated um, employee generation study, not just for outdoor dining, but for our entire code, um, that we would also look at outdoor dining space to make sure that this, if we do include outdoor dining space in the future, that the number is accurate. Um, and our goal as, as COVID hit, right when we were planning to do our study last year, um, our goal is to, once things start to normalize a little bit, to definitely go out and, and conduct that study. Um, so those are the two revisions to policy 24R that we're proposing today. And I'm available to answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, questions? 
Um, I have a general question um, just about AMI and how it's calculated and how often it's calculated. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what the shift we're seeing where we have um, more new remote residents that are maybe making a higher income, how that's going to impact numbers calculation. That is a really good question. Um, there's kind of two, two answers. This, this AMI number gets updated every year um, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And this number, um, it kind of has a, we call it like a back lag, which is kind of, which is partly why we are trying to get rid of, get, not get rid of AMI, but not follow AMI when we do appreciation formulas and things like that, because it's usually like five years, kind of looking at five years data in the past. Um, so when you'd be in a really high point in terms of incomes that look like we're in a recession with AMI and vice versa, because they are looking at data from not necessarily right the year before, but um, maybe a few years before. Um, so I would anticipate that our incomes, because it's based off of family income in our community. Um, so if we have more families, more households here, then there will be more households to take AMI information from, income information from. So I would say that I would anticipate that it would likely increase, but that we may not see that like stark increase until, you know, a few years down the road. Um, AMI is on an upward trend right now. Um, it hit a dip and started to climb upwards. And last year, I believe the increase was 8%. So it is on the uh, incline part of this um, data trend, but it is updated every year. And, our, and how this would be updated is that we would, um, and uh, this number will be updated in the chart. So we'll, we would update the AMI number and we'd also update the median sales price for market rate units as those will, you know, likely that will likely increase too. So that number every year will be updated once new AMI numbers are established. So we'll go back in and, and um, reevaluate the data points to make sure that they're accurate. But yeah, AMI, it does fluctuate and it could definitely be impacted by the, um, the uh, change in our uh, people who live and work here. Excellent. Thank you, Nicole. Does that makes sense, everyone. Yeah. Go ahead, Kelly. So Nicole, how long, I mean, I know that in the packet it said we talked about this in May 2020, but how long, um, I mean, have we missed, I know that reading the planning notes from last, or last week, it looked like we missed out on some fee and lieu there. Have we been sitting on this a really long time and missed out on a lot of money? No, this actually this application was the first to my knowledge that ha would have been eligible, like kind of in that realm of would have paid a fee in lieu, but didn't because we didn't have a calculation adopted. Um, so this is the only one that I know of. Okay, and so if the um, for the application, if it generates three and a half employees, then they would be responsible for the three and then they could do the fee and lieu for the half. Is that right? Or they could. So they, that. anything, if you owe anything above one employee, then you have to create housing or you have to create housing by either deed restricting existing or building new. So there, once you're above that one, basically one or more threshold, fee and lieu is no longer an, an option. So okay. this, this below one, is really because it'd be hard to create a unit. But if anyone's adding more square footage, that you know, that's where this triggers, and that's where this one came into play. Because a lot of the um, applications, I think, that come through, and, and Mark could probably say better to this, but um, they might be just remodeling within the existing square footage they already have, which is why it wouldn't trigger a fee and lieu requirement. Um, so it's very, it's going to be you know, a narrow kind of group that would would this would apply to. But it's really to you know still address that they're they are technically generating more impact and more need for housing, but not necessarily enough to build a whole new unit or go deed restrict a, a full unit. Okay, thanks for explaining that. Other questions? Hey, Eric. Yes, uh, well, one thing I I talked to Tim Barry about this. I'd like to make a change after uh, before second reading. Because we do have the calculation table in the actual ordinance, I want to make it clear that that's an example of, of the calculation for the 2021 fee in lieu and that that will adjust each year uh, as the AMI changes. So I want to make it clear that we do not, I, don't, I do not want to have to come back 
and amend this every year when the AMI changes. So, um, okay, yeah, that when, makes total sense. when it comes time to make a motion, will someone make that a little bit clearer? We'll do no. it in between first and second, <laughs> Jeffrey. Jeffrey, it's not you don't need anything, any change tonight. All right, all right, it's for second reading. Yeah, because sometimes Aaron messes up when it when we switch on the fly like that, and it's embarrassing for us all. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm the problem, clearly. <laughs> so, are any early in the meeting for this? <laughs> are any applications going to come in in the next month that we're going to miss out on? No, Mark. I don't know if it, you'll see Mark's camera on. I would say maybe that's a Mark question. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe there are going to be Kelly. Um, I think I think we're going to be okay. There might be one that gets through the door, but I'm not aware of anything right now. So we're getting, I mean, the sooner we adopt it, obviously the sooner it can take effect. So there's, there's no need to do this as an emergency ordinance, correct? I would. Okay. All right, other questions? No, let's go to uh, the Pinewood, Pinewood one sale disposition, first reading. Lori? Yes, good afternoon, Eric, Mayor and Council. Um, this is a first reading for the ordinance that um, actually would um, authorize Rick to sign the purchase agreement, um, uh, purchase and sale agreement, we're on the seller side. Um, and this has to do with the sale of the, um, the Pinewood um, One property, the land that is under that property and any, any interest that we had in the land lease, as you recall, um, we own that property and we did this land lease way back in 1996 and Pinewood Village has um, served our locals um, with very well priced um, apartments for many years and we believe that this agreement um, will ensure that it continues to serve our locals um, because we're basically out of our proceeds we are paying for a deed restriction that will run in perpetuity with the land um, that will equal the deed restriction that's on it under the current land lease. So um, we support um, uh, the purchase and sale agreement. Um, Tim still needs to go through it with a fine tooth comb um, and check some of the um, uh, aspects of the um, purchase and sale agreement, but we expect it's gonna be consistent with the letter of intent that you already executed. Everybody good with this? You understand? What's going on here? Okay, thank you, Lori. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now we have uh, four ordinances uh, authorizing negotiations and if necessary, animated domain proceeding to acquire property interest necessary as part of the Goose Pasture Tarn Dam Rehabilitation <laughs> Project. We have Thomas Three Peaks LLC, Rolfs and Belinda Gale Kramer Revocable Trust. Tim. This, th these are me, Eric. Uh, as the council's aware, we have, we're about to commence work on the uh, Goose Pasture Tarn project this spring. We need certain easements, primarily temporary easements, uh, to be able to do the project. We have been negotiating uh, with these property owners for some time now, and I'm pleased to say that since the packet was assembled Last week, we have resolved two of the four issues. Um, that is uh, the Three Peaks LLC, which is Mr. Bradley's LLC, and Mr. and Mrs. Rolfe. We have both of those signed deals done. So those two ordinances will need to be removed okay. tonight. Um, we also have an agreement in concept with the Kramer uh, folks. Um, we haven't received it yet, but we've been told that they'll sign it and send it back. Uh, so I would like to leave that one on just in case. Uh, and on Mr. Thomas's, we've been working with him. We've been trying to get to a mutually agreeable uh, agreement. We have some uh, progress there and we're gonna continue. James and I will continue to work with Mr. Thomas to see if we can ultimately get a, an agreement that's beneficial or acceptable to both parties. So I would like to have the, the two taken off, Three Peaks and Rolfs. The other two 
uh, to go to first reading with the hope that by the time of second reading, we won't need either of them. Tim, for the public, um, the reason that we need to press on with these two, though, is it's a timing issue at this point, correct? Yes, Eric, that's exactly right. Um, you know, eminent domain is one of those things. It's a power that local governments have, but you've got to be very careful and circumspect about when you use it. Um, it's a very heavy handed sort of power, the ability to take somebody's property for a public purpose. But that power is there nonetheless. Um, and the process of, of getting going, starting him in a domain still takes several months. Um, and that's why we're here, you know, in early February for a, an April or May start date. If we were unsuccessful in negotiating with any of the three or the, any of the property owners, we would have to go to court. And there are some procedures that are required for that and it's gonna take a little bit of time. Um, like I say, I don't think that we're gonna to have to file, at least I'm very hopeful that we won't have to file, but you know, we can't delay the commencement of this project because of these easements, we need to get it done. And I think quite frankly, that the property owners understand that. Very good. Um, and also for everyone in the public's benefit, this is a life safety issue um, with the failure, potential failure of the Tarn Dam. So the council feels this is a necessary action. None of us like eminent domain, you know, as Tim said, it is difficult, it is heavy handed, but when it comes to the safety of the community, uh, if this is the way we have to go, then this is the way we have to go. So we will see these two tonight. Um, council questions for Tim. Tim, is, is this some, <clears throat> does the state have say in this as far as if and when we do this dam? Um, James, you wanna speak to the uh, construction timetable? Time yeah, I'd be happy to. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Town Council. Um, yes, Jeffrey, the, the state, we've, we've been working with the state for several years right now, and we've actually delayed this project by a year um, due to COVID. And so it was originally we anticipated that we would be under construction this year already, um, or last year, I should say, I'm sorry. But um, that being said, the state is giving us a directive that we do need to, to repair this dam we're under a restrictive um, uh, condition uh, for the time right now uh, with respect to how much water can uh, be stored in that tarn um, as present. So the state is, we are running, I won't say we're running out of time with the state, but they are expecting that we do perform the work and they're expecting us to begin the work this May as Tim has already indicated. What, in, in layman's terms, what, um... What would happen if the dam were to fail? I know the dam was built in the 60s or something. Yeah, the, the dam was built in 1965. It was constructed um, 1965. Um, originally, it wasn't uh, constructed for kind of the intended purpose that it, it provides today. But in real, you know, kind of in a brief description, if the dam was to breach, there is a condition that um, under certain environmental um, factors the dam could breach. And it's, you know, while that's not a, um, anything that we're planning for at this point, we're planning to repair it. Um, but if the dam were to breach and there was a weather event associated with that, basically what would happen, there would be a eight foot wall of water that would commence at the point of this spillway and go all the way through town, effectively bifurcating the town of Breckenridge and wiping out quite a bit of commercial and residential um, and town properties as it cut its way down to the Dillon Reservoir. So we wouldn't want that to happen. We definitely would not want that to happen. Hey Tim, um, obviously we hope that by the second reading we'd be able to come to a final agreement with all four property owners. But in the case that we had to file and we had a court date, we can continue to negotiate 
with the property owners. Is that correct? Absolutely. That is, you probably, you may not have heard, we, <clears throat> we have reached agreement now with two of the four. No, I, I did hear that. Thank you. And, uh, but yes, you're right. If, if we had to go to court, I mean, it's good. The, the process itself takes a while to work its way through the system. And at any time while you're in court, you can settle. Um, so absolutely, we, you know, if we had to go to court to get these easements, you can do that on, a, on an emergency sort of basis while the lawsuit is actually pending and working its way through the court. Um, but yes, the, we will absolutely, we want to try to resolve this amicably uh, um, with the property owners. Um, and I, I don't want to give the misimpression that we're going to go to court because hopefully we won't have to do that. This is just a kind of a backstop or a what if we're not able to get the deals done. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, final questions? Okay. Hey, Tim. Yes, sir. Does, does this encumber their property? Once this process starts, you know, if, if we're unable to, to come to an agreement, um, you know, by second reading, and, and we kind of initiate the process. At what point, if any, is, are their properties encumbered in any way? Well, Dick, they would, early in the process, and I'm talking about within the next couple of months, we would be in front of the court asking for, temp, for immediate possession of the easements that we need. Um, and, if, and the court has the power to grant that um, to us we have to deposit a certain amount of money in the court to pay to pay for those easements. Um, I mean, it, it, it would have some in fact, in, impact on the, the owner's property. Okay. So that's still a, a, a few weeks away or a couple months away. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Well, good. Well, I'm with you. I certainly hope we can come to an amicable. I'm, I, I'm, I'm optimistic. And I think James shares that optimism. Great. All right, anyone else? Good, Tim, James, thank you. Uh, we have Breckenridge Nordisk Center uh, promissory note amendment. Ryan. Hello everybody. Um, I think this could be a, a fairly quick item. The, the operators of the Breckenridge Nordic Center, the Daytons, reached out to the town a while ago and Similar to what we're seeing in the uh, business environment in general with different kinds of loan relief or refinancing opportunities that we see in, in general, they were wondering what the town might be able to do in that vein to, to help them up there with, with some of the issues they've been having with um, restrictions and potential lost revenue and, and things of the, that nature. So the very simple, I think, and helpful way uh, to work with the Daytons and to help them with um, you know, saving some money is to refinance their loan, basically. This is a construction loan that we gave to the Daytons to build the lodge. Its original principal amount was about 1.3 million. That was the cost to build the new lodge up there. They've been paying on it timely ever since. And what we're proposing is this resolution that would approve a change in the interest rate from four to 3%. And that would save them about 626 bucks a month, going all the way through the end of the loan, which is in 2044. And that adds up to uh, over $170,000. So I think that's a quick and easy way to give them some monthly help. And it's also something that if they held this loan out in um, just the regular marketplace, let's call it, that's an opportunity that would be available to them right now as well. Uh, as we all know, refinancing debt is a big um, a big step a lot of people are taking right now. So if anybody has any questions or, or comments. So I'm, I support this, but I'm just curious since it is connected or it has been connected to um, potential loss in revenue, do we have an idea about how, how they're doing as a business? Well, that, that's why I said potential. Uh, some of the restrictions have affected them and their ability uh, my understanding to host weddings and things like that over the summer mm -hmm. and also the occupancy of the lodge and selling snacks or whatnot, but we have not looked 
at the okay. mix. So I know their, you know, we know their business has been impacted, but we can't speak to any actual loss in revenue. Okay, right. and that's fair. I'm just curious. Go ahead, Rick. I'll just add in there that the Dayton's actually uh, started off with a much bigger ask. They wanted, you know, they wanted to restructure the loan. They wanted to create a new term. They wanted to do a five-year interest only and then start a new 30-year term on top of that, which would, would have put the end out considerably. And what we did was, you know, this was never built to be a wedding venue. It was built to be a Nordic center. It's turned into a popular wedding venue, which, you know, we, we try to control and manage that also. That's probably the biggest hit they've had. Uh, I think people that are users will tell you that it's been pretty busy up there um, under other uh, circumstances. So, you know, this is a compromise that we made and uh, we thought it was appropriate. So this is all we're doing is just lowering the interest rate. And, and it's considerable, but uh, uh, they're happy with, with what the town's willing to do. So. Great. Other questions? I'm, I'm glad we're supporting them. I, I understand it was never designed to be a wedding venue, but I, I can tell you from a little bit of experience and properties and businesses like this, good for them for getting that going because otherwise it'd be awfully hard to, to make the numbers work. And, and I can assure you that their business has been hit extremely hard in the last year. Um, you know, based on the events they do. So I am, I'm in support of this and, and uh, glad that we've, we've uh, considered it. Yeah, I like Dick, I'm, I too am in, uh, in support. And yeah, and they, they get kind of, I think they get hurt. You, you go up, I go up there for a mountain and there is people on the trails, but part of their business is in their lodge. And that, that uh, something I've anecdotally, I've seen uh, a lot less people, a lot less people are comfortable in the inside but it is an activity we want to encourage. So yeah, this is an easy way to hopefully uh, make it a little bit easier for them to survive. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm down with this. Awesome. Anyone else? All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Tim. Uh, let's move on to public projects update. Shannon Smith. Hello, Mr. Mayor and Council. I didn't have a written update for you on the public projects, but I can take any questions. When are we going to put this at the beginning to put the ski in on the parking structure, the, the aesthetics? So the siding will start coming on probably on the north side facing Watson in the beginning of March. Shannon, how's our timing right now on the structure? We are completely on schedule. Everything's looking really good over there. Excellent. Nice to hear. Hey, Shannon, um, congrats on being the winner for the <laughs> use of technology. That was a cool little video. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What did you Another want? thing I'll add, and Shannon can weigh in on this. I think that we passed a lot of our milestones that could have created. There were there are certain activities related to the parking structure that we don't have total control over. And one of the biggest ones was obviously the precast concrete. Um, and so the fact that that's all in place uh, makes us think that the majority of the things moving forward should not, there shouldn't be surprises, right, Shannon, that we should be able to, to meet our schedule comfortably. Yep, I agree, Rick. There was things with utilities and the precast, like you said, and getting started on what we call the topping slabs, the poured in place concrete. And we've been hitting those milestones right on track. That's great. Other questions for Shannon? Yeah, we're still going to get you guys on a tour, but we may look at like, you know, springtime when we know the weather's a little nicer and there'll be a little more completion out there. So that sounds good. Yeah. I'd like to get out there when it's really windy and really cold. We do that. <laughs> That's what we figured. It's warm on the inside. Good, good. How's uh, any more questions for Shannon? All right. Um, in light of what happened in Florida with their water system, I asked James to update us on uh, what we're doing to protect our water system. For those of you who didn't hear, somebody hacked into a 
local municipalities water system and change the amount of chemicals that were put into their um, water. And fortunately, an observant employee caught it before anyone was injured uh, or potentially killed. So um, Dick uh, asked the question earlier, and I thought we'd have it so the public could hear James's answer, if he has one. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, I guess what I would, you know, I just recently read that article. I read it <clears throat> last night, and it was just as you indicated, somebody hacked into their system, and they changed the dosage of a uh, chemical that we don't use here with sodium hydroxide. And that chemical is used to raise the pH in water. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I can say for our system is, is that we don't add anything, anything certainly as nasty as sodium hydroxide to our water. The only thing that we really add to our water, um, excepting a little bit of fluoride, is chlorine. And chlorine is a disinfectant um, that we use to, to disinfect the water, of course. Um, what I can say about our security is, is that we worked, water division worked with our IT division this summer and we implemented a kind of a new, more robust system for gaining access to our, our water system. So the protocol right now, what it requires is multiple passwords for our operators to gain access to the system. And then it also in turn um, asks for a, a text that provides a code that the operator then in turn has to enter the code to be able to gain access into the system. So um, while I, I won't say it's impossible, but I'd say it'd be very unlikely anybody could gain access into our SCADA system. Our, of the three water plants that we have, two of them, the Gary Roberts water treatment plant and the Wellington oil, water plant, they are not even connected to the internet. They're independent <laughs> systems that live on their own. Um, our newest water plant, of course, the Breck North water plant is connected to our town service um, currently, but it undergoes that same process that I just explained for gaining access to the system. Um, the, the one area that somebody could, if there was a, a, a breach of that security, really about the only area that somebody could go in and um, increase a dosage or uh, change up the system would be for that chlorine. And with our new system, we embedded multiple alarms within the software that would shut down the system. So it would make it virtually impossible for someone to actually change that dose rate without there being multiple alarms going off and ultimately shutting the system down. Um, so. I guess in short, and hopefully this answers the question, it would be really not very feasible for somebody to enter in the system. Um, I also know that you know, the, the investigation and the report hasn't really uh, been concluded for that um, breach down in Florida, but um, I won't be surprised. I mean, if there was some breach of our system, it would probably be just as likely it was an inside job of some sort uh, for that to take place. So. Again, I'm not making any um, comment to what's going on in Florida, but I think that would be, um, that's a possibility certainly. In our case, if we did have a separation of any employees or anything, we change all those the protocols and the codes for access into the system. So hopefully that answered the question and I'd be happy to take any follow-up questions if there are any. Great, thanks James. Questions for James? Okay. All right, thanks for giving us that information. And so it's out in the public too. Thank you. Uh, any other public projects uh, for anybody? All right, how about parking and transportation? That was, we did that. Um, housing and child care update. Hello, Corey Burr. Hello, Eric, how are you? Good. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, you have minutes in the um, packet for both our December meeting and our most recent February meeting. The committee did not hold a January meeting. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions or talk, go over anything that we discussed in the meeting. Okay, question on the meetings. Um, I was just curious why um, 
why we're receiving December's now? Um, good question. <laughs> um, I didn't realize that it had never been sent. So I included it on this one. Okay. So it was completely okay. just an error and making sure that you saw it. Human error. Okay. She's been busy getting Thanks. rent checks out to people. <laughs> Anyway. And I wasn't trying to call you call anybody out or any. I just wasn't sure if there was something that needed to be decided or if there was something that came in later. Yeah, but okay. you can call Thank me you. out. It was me. I held it. <laughs> okay. uh, we've been piling a bunch of stuff on Corey's shoulders, so I think a lapse in minute meetings is fine. Yeah, absolutely. No, I I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions for Corey while she's here? Yeah, Corey, curious how. Um, were you happy with how many applicants applied for the open commission seat? How'd that go? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we actually, the one app, the one person that their term was over uh, reapplied. And then we actually only received one new application and it was after the close of the, um, of the, the acceptance period. Um, so we discussed it with the child care committee um, and they would like to, uh, and this will be at the next meeting to request the appointment, but um, appoint just the person that is currently on the committee and then wait until next year to look at another member. All right, we're good. Corey, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. All right, committee reports, uh, transit and parking, summit stage, Short rate, and then there's the short range transit plan. So does anybody have any questions? I'm sure you all read this before bed. So uh, we'll keep an eye on the transit plan. This is obviously the things that, that are on our radar screen that we monitor from the town's perspective is new route assignments. And you know that's part of their short range plan, but they also realize they have to figure out how to pay for new routes when they're coming on. And so we have a person that sits on that uh, summit stage committee and we stay abreast of what's being talked about and we'll keep you, uh, you know, in the loop on that also. Questions? So my only question was that I saw that um, any more, um, I guess, trips to park was pretty down on their list of priorities. And I just wondered if we as a town wanted to um, partner with them to help that raise that on their list of priorities. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Jen. I think we'd wanna to talk to Jen about that and see, I'm not sure what the current ridership is on the numbers that are. Yeah happening right now and if it warrants more um so yeah i would you know just to kind of follow up on that to that question and i would agree with rick i don't know that we the ridership is necessarily supportive of that right now but we do partner financially with that route we contribute um 50 isn't it i think we contribute 50 yeah. percent of the funding for that route currently and it was when that route came together, there was basically an agreement, a three year agreement to kind of generate the ridership and see how that performance increases. And if um, the performance of that route didn't um, commensurate with the kind of the funding or increase, I guess, that route would be kind of re examined for really, you know, need and yeah. need in the future. So that's where we're at right now. I think we're in year two right now, Kelly. Okay. That's great to know. And COVID's going to be tough, right? Because some people don't yeah. sit on that bus for an hour. Like that. Yeah, and I didn't mean like pronto, but I'm glad that we're watching it. It sounds like we're in the right spot. <laughs> hey, James, what do you have any figures on how many people have been getting left at bus stops due to I, COVID? I did. I do. I can speak to this one a little bit, Eric. I don't know that I'm going to have um, you know, specific numbers or writers, but what I can share with you is that um, currently we do, we do recognize two periods of the day that we have um, certainly capacity issues, with, which contributes to folks being left behind. Um, the main routes that, that occurs on um, are the gray, the gray route. And as we know, there's four buses on that gray route. 
that service that. Um, keep in mind, there's 70, the data that we're collecting, there's 79% of the ridership is on the gray route. And so in response to that, what we have been able to do four days a week, um, Thursday through Sundays, we're able to run two chase buses on the gray route to help pick up the, 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 the additional ridership that we is left behind. Also one of the, you know, as part of our SOP, our standard operating procedures, that is, um, when folks are at a stop and the buses are at capacity, our drivers are instructed to go ahead and stop and verbally advise them that there's a, a chase bus that will be coming or there'll be another bus coming um, within that 15 minute period and sometimes 30 minutes. But that is an SOP that um, I did confirm that with a, um, Andy Cotton, our assistant transit manager, and just made sure that we're still undergoing that. We also put that on the marquee too. So it's visible if our bus is at capacity on the front of the bus, it says the bus is basically full. But again, our drivers are following up on that um, as well. So the reason I ask, you know, I was on the purple the other day and left some people at the bus stop who are obviously um, visitors. How do we, and I know there's no chase bus on purple. How, what instructions do we have at the stop for them? Do we have anything that says, you know, the next bus will be a half an hour. You can walk to town. I'm, I, I hadn't thought about it before that, but I want to make sure that, you know, we don't get a black eye from doing what the state is making us do and that we have enough information for people that they can figure out another way to get into town. Right. What I can say about that, Eric, is we do have information that is posted at the stops. Um, probably what I can also say is it's not as, probably it's not as obvious, you know, it's not as big and, and print as it should be or could be. And we can certainly look at increasing the size of it and making it a little bit more um, an observation um, so a guest would know that. I do know, you know, again, kind of from follow up with the drivers and anecdotally that most of the overload is occurring at Breck Station where we pick up most of the, the riders. Um, certainly not that we want to base all our, our success on complaints, but we haven't received that much feedback on the purple route in terms of leaving riders behind. Um, in, in fact, most of the complaints that we get for capacity and ridership is based on when we have two when it's perceived that we have too many people on too many people in the buses. So um, it's kind of you know that balance of striking that balance of having the right amount of people on the bus per state um, requirements and then also being able to provide that chase bus to pick up riders. But okay. we can certainly look at increasing the size of some of that message at the stops. If, uh, I, you know, and I, I would say if you did that, you'd only have to do it at a couple of stops. You know, there, there's, it would really be the stops later on the route um, that are more in areas where there are visitors. You know, locals know how to do it. If I got left behind, I know how to walk into town. Um, so, you know, maybe it, maybe it would be three or four stops at the most that we would need to do something. Yeah, I believe, I believe you're correct. Eric, I can touch base with transit and okay. yeah, our drivers, every time there's a guest that's left behind at a stop, they immediately, the SOP is to radio a supervisor and okay. we try to roll a bus to go ahead if there's not a chase bus on route already to, to pick up those passengers. And again, in talking with um, the assistant manager, his belief is, is that we not only is our goal to get everybody within 30 minutes, but we feel like we are pretty close to being able to achieve that and say that straight right. face. So. Fair enough. Thank Thanks, you. James. Hey, uh, James, how's the mask compliance on, on the buses? Any anecdotal sense of that? Um, we're getting good compliance with that. And as we, as um, I'm sure everyone here has been briefed that there is a new FTA mandate that came through as a order from, um, through a um, order through the new president. Um, and so we are, we have changed some of the messaging for mass compliance on the buses. Some of what was acceptable previously is now not acceptable. Um, for instance, scarves are no longer acceptable as a mask. 
And so we are we have made a campaign to message that to our ridership, and we do believe it's um, again that it's being a folks that are riding the buses it is being compliant. So again, we haven't seen a big change in and um, since that new FTA direction has come out. Okay, and we'll stop the bus and have them removed if they don't comply. So that is correct. So does that mean? So, sorry, um, does that mean that buffs are not allowed? You can, it's my understanding you can still wear buffs, but you have to double them up and kind of double ply them okay. as for them to be kind of meet the new requirement. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And anything else for James on transit? All right, James, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have an events committee memo, and we have a larger discussion later. So if you have any actual questions on the memo itself, let's hear them. If not, this will move to the big discussion in a little while. No? All right. Excellent. Um, then we go to planning matters. We have the McC uh, McCain Pond Filling and Drainage Improvements Town Project. Chris Kulik. All right. Well, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions on it. It's pretty straightforward. It's really just a lot of the site work that we anticipated with the Alta Verde project. But we really wanted to be fully transparent that we were filling the pond. And this was anticipated uh, during the McCain master plan. So that was the main reason of taking it back as a town project. Uh, how much public outcry have you had, Chris? We have not received any comments. Uh, via any medium, whether it through their through the town project hearing at planning commission or any written correspondence. All right. Yes, when when you uh, you drain the pond and fill it, correct? You know, I'm not exactly sure the the mechanics behind behind it. I mean it's there is a little bit of a groundwater source uh, coming in, but it's um, it's not connected to any um, any above grade waterway and that that was confirmed by the Army Corps. And I believe that we included a memo from Chris McGinnis to that effect. Um, so I'm not sure if they drain it or if they just start filling it or, you know, it's kind of the the proverbial bathtub full of marbles, you know, in that that area that we've we've talked about a lot over the years with uh, tailings. I can speak to that question, Chris. Um, the, the pond isn't going to be drained. It's going to just be filled with the rock. Um, the, the pond is a groundwater sourced kind of pond. Um, and um, I did kind of chat with engineering about like the future of that pond and with the river realignment, it's likely that it would have actually become empty at some point in the future too anyways. So um, you know, the goal is to just um, fill that rock, fill the pond with larger rocks first. And then as we come up, um, we'll have um, more refined fill um, as there might be potential that that could be part of the extension of the road to the school district site in the future. Okay. Other questions? All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. See you tonight. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, we have small cell update. This is a TC memo. Julia. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Town Council. Um, I just wanted to come before you. Um, we have not given you an update on our small cell project in quite a while. Um, and as you know, the FCC uh, several years ago passed um, some regulations to allow 5G technology in municipal rights of way. Um, and it removed a lot of the government authority um, behind the review for those. Um, we went through a quick process on um, RFI, and we selected American Tower and Newcom. Um, council gave us the go ahead to move forward with that. And that is for um, a more cohesive approach to small cells in our right of way, especially in our conservation district. And um, also had a layer of macro sites over it as well. Sort of like creating a web of connectivity um, to provide reliable cell phone service while being aesthetically pleasing um, within our conservation district. So we've had a few things happen <laughs> since um, we were before you last. Um, American Tower has since contacted us, let us know that um, the poll that they had proposed that you've seen um, is actually not going to be manufactured anymore. Um, that poll manufacturer 
just will not be making that poll for numerous reasons. The second update that came shortly after that was that American Tower um, was under some new leadership um, at their top level. And the direction from that um, person was that they are going to pull out of the small cell industry for now and focus on what they see as their strength, which were larger tower sites. So American Tower has pulled out of the project. Newcom, which was a Denver-based company that was working with American Tower, and we, we asked them to partner on purpose because Newcom had um, a better grasp of uh, the, our locality and, and what our needs were here. They've requested to go ahead and continue um, without American Tower. And staff had, we have an internal committee made up of Shannon Haynes, uh, Mark Johnston, Chris Liberto, and um, Tumberry has sat on some of these as well, and myself. And um, we're recommending that we go forward with Newcom. Um, we've had some discussions with them. The deal points are going to remain the same. So the town is still not going to be putting any money up front. It's sort of all based on uh, Newcom connecting the poles to the town's fiber network and, um, and, and working with directly with the providers. Um, they would get the entitlements for the providers that they sign on. And um, you know, we'd be looking at a co-location poll system. And that's, that's sort of key of what we wanted. The first phase, just so you all know, um, consisted of, consists of six poles at three intersections on Main Street. And so um, Newcom is working on uh, getting a good pole replacement for what's no longer being manufactured. We don't um, have one that we're happy with quite at this time. When we do find one um, with Newcom, we're going to bring that back before you before we proceed forward. Um, Newcom would also, as part of the deal, have to sign um, at least one of the major providers on um, under contract before they, you know, take a shovel to the ground, so um, that we have that confirmation. And we've been talking about having them do that within the, a year period. So that's sort of where we're at. Um, once we have those, if we're given the go ahead and we get that poll design, um, how we like it and take it before you. We're also proposing to revise the design standards, which we've been holding off for until we had a good poll design. Because right now we feel like the design standards we have, um, you know, allow for more height than we'd like to see. And there's uh, more design advancements that we've seen in the um, field as well of small cells, and we'd like to incorporate that. We've been working um, with the our telecommunication Ken Fellman um, attorney on that as well, um, closely with Tim Barry. So that's the update. And um, I guess at this point, I'd just like to entertain any questions and then see if the town council is in favor of con us continuing forward with the plan with Newcom. everybody think hey julia do you has ken um said what he thinks the future of the new fcc board is going to be and their decisions on this kind of stuff i have not heard anything i'm i'll let tim weigh in if he has but i haven't gotten anything and then i believe a few years ago a state bill was passed that allowed these infrastructure companies to also come in in the right of way that's absolutely correct, Carol. Uh, it's both, it's the, the issue really is both state and federal. Eric, the, the chair of the FCC, I believe resigned. Um, you know, the, these are a political appointments as right. I understand it in the, the uh, Republican controlled uh, presidency uh, ended up with three Republicans on, on the board and two Democrats. There is hope, I think, that the, um, the composition will change. It will have democratic control uh, FCC. And I think that's gonna happen, I hope, rather quickly. 
Okay. All right, is everybody okay with uh, moving along as Julia has indicated? Show yeah, hands. Yeah, might everybody as well. Good? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Uh, community survey for a possible ballot question about getting Jeffrey off council. <laughs> I recall. <laughs> All right, Lori Best. Hey, Janie. Hello again. Um, well, I, in your in your packet, I enclosed a copy of a um, proposal um, for um, some polling around the issue of um, child care in the community and support. Um, you know, we've we've talked before about the fact that the fund balance for the child care program um, is um, going to probably um, by 2024 ish um, we will have. Um, use the entire fund balance um, based on the current sort of um, contributions to that fund. Um, so we've talked about, you know, what are our options for um, sustaining the program? And uh, we met recently, um, Rick and Carol and Kelly and Corey and I, to talk about strategies looking forward. And um, the idea came up that it probably makes most sense to understand um, where the community is and with this issue right now so that we could figure out best approaches, um, whether it's a ballot initiative for childcare or a bundled um, initiative. Um, we don't know what would be the best strategy until we check in with the community. So um, I contacted um, Magellan um, Strategies and um, they submitted a proposal which we reviewed and um, we would like to move forward um, with contracting with them to pursue a um, it's a phone and text um, survey that would be conducted late spring, early summer. Um, want to get through obviously the winter, um, but don't want to get too far into the summer um, uh, because it will take some time after we get the results um, from that survey to figure out what our strategy and our approach will be going forward. So um, I did invite um, David um, Flaherty. I, I see he's here in attendance. Um, in case the council wanted to talk specifically about um, the survey or the issue um, or just meet David. Um, and, and so with that, um, we can answer any questions. All right, David, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Mr. Mayor and council. Happy to answer any questions about you know, our experience, our approach. We've done many surveys similar to this in small mountain communities um, with a lot of success. It, it really is, a, you know, we think a very time-tested approach. We've done this probably over the last 12 years in you know, 50 or 60 different areas, special districts. Um, and our role is really to help you measure and understand opinions of residents or voters if you are going to the ballot or considering something. So that, um, you know, you really hear the voice of the community. Um, and uh, our approach that we've used a lot in 2020 was a, a text approach that's been phenomenal. Um, it worked very well uh, up over the Vale Valley in the town of Vale, very similar population of yours, about 3,500 people. And anyways, I'm, I'm happy to provide examples, uh, you know, and so forth, metro districts. Um, there's a little bit more to it perhaps than it may seem like what, what, what's so hard, let's just send things out but to really measure and understand uh, where the community is and whether or not is something going to perhaps get there uh, before any kind of campaign. We know there's no town involvement whatsoever, but anyways, that's, we had a lot of experience doing this, Mr. Mayor, and happy to answer some questions. Great, thank you, David. Uh, question. Yeah, David, what percentage of your efforts go into actual person-to-person -person calls compared to Texas? I mean, I know personally, I have my phone it won't ring unless it's a number that's in my contacts. Sure. In 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 a lot of times, yeah. If I if I see a strange number, I don't pick up. Now I might look at Texas, but yep. yep. No, absolutely. And, and what we'll do, Jeffrey, is we first we do it in waves. The first wave is to do a text survey, and in that text, there's an image, and it'll have the town of Breckenridge, and it's going to say, "Hi, we really want to listen and learn from you. There's some important issues we'd like to hear uh, you know hear from you about." Um, we'll have a contact person for, you know, communications, whoever, and say that we're, we're here to listen and learn. When they click on that on their text, it takes them and they will take it right on their phone. 
um, we have several examples in our proposals of what that will look like. And from that, Jeffrey, we're going to pick up because, you know, we'll probably have half, maybe 60 percent of individual cell phones. So that's where it's going. We're allowed to send it without your permission. Um, we make it as user friendly as possible to try to increase engagement. When that is done, and here's the other thing that's you know really exciting about this new approach, which we really tested in 2020, it's not like all right, we're only going to talk to you know people that are 45 or under. Like we get a good amount of the older population as well, and we think a lot of that has to do with just because of the COVID effect, senior citizens, more people have become more tech savvy. Um, so it's the distribution curve on the you know unweighted data on the unweighted data is actually pretty darn good. But what we like to do is a little dose of phones if needed, perhaps to the older population. And, you know, honestly, uh, the cost for me to hire a call center, uh, we're going to call everybody, landlines and cells, to do follow-up. Um, but, you know, we, we keep an eye on the texting and who's responded. We do not know who responds to the text. We will ask, you know, perhaps what HOA or neighborhood you're within. So it's very anonymous. Um, but yet we do have things set up so that it's not you know, one household's not taking the survey a million times because they have a, a vested interest. So that, that's part of the process, Jeffrey, um, how I can best explain it. And it's great because the text really does pick up that younger demographic where especially that'd be a little bit more tougher to penetrate. So in, you know, before without doing text and just doing phone only. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing that like, if you do something in the Vale Valley, it's the same, much of the same demos here. And I bet yep. of this crowd of, of these people on my, my screen, I. I, I don't, I, I would, would imagine only one or two of us have a landline. I mean, we, I'd we assume it's you. By Texas. I mean, absolutely, by Absolutely, Jeffrey. Yeah. And it's, it, it, you're absolutely right. And, and it is. It's, com in fact, uh, we, we're in the field right now at the state survey. If you really want to know how many landlines, I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're barely going to scratch anybody age 44 and under with a landline. Um, and so that's why this hybrid approach of cell phones, which is text and more engagement friendly, and it's a nice message. Plus, when you know where it's coming from, it's a government entity or a special district. Uh, yeah. People know like, oh, this is official. This is good. So um, that data collection approach is, uh, you know, we're very excited. I mean, we interviewed over, you know, 700 people uh, in Vail when they were looking to do a local D Gallagher last year. And, um, you know, where we had done work for them on their housing uh, and a lot of other projects for them where we only had phones and we, we beat the heck out of that file over like six days tell everybody we're calling and, you know, we'd be, be lucky to crack 300. So my hope is, is, and we have a whole process too, to work, send an advanced email. We want to use the list or we want everybody to know this is coming when it's coming so that, you know, engagement is good. Um, and you guys really get a, a good listen. And we're obviously going to weight it, you know, proportionally and representatively to the population. And I know we're, we're waiting on that great census data that's going to be coming out, which is one thing, but also just that, you know, we use data from the voter file to get a really good uh, snapshot of age. So that's- in one more question, then I won't bug you anymore. I'm sure worries, the, yeah. the other kids have some. You're not doing anything with, with snail mail. No, no, no. I, I, I don't mean to be critical of the snail mail community survey industry, which has served so many people well and our friends in those research firms. But um, I, I, I um, I would beg to differ that in today's technology that perhaps snail mail is not needed in unless you do want an unweighted sample of very uh, elderly residents who we care a lot about and not talk to a, a young family demographic. Hey, have at it. I know you throw in an email there, uh, you know, and, and that approach. We feel this text approach is much yeah. more effective and plus um, we can send it out. It's very cost effective, unlike a piece of mail and it gets done quicker. So anyway, good question. Um, ha happy to talk about that, even though we all know, hey, um, it, it's what a lot of folks in governments have relied on in municipalities. So it's, they've done good work. But anyways, it's, uh, it's 2021. We can do some new things, I think. But that's for another conversation, Jeffrey. David, what I did like is that you tell them how long it's going to take and you give them an option to opt out. Yes, sir. That's impressive. A absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many people start the survey and then don't complete it so you could potentially yes, we do, alter Mayor. it as time goes on? Yes, we do. Uh, the completion rate is what we call it. Typically on a, a tax or just general community survey like this, we'll usually see um, you know, a completion rate of people that do, eventually, you know, that do engage with it, um, typically somewhere around 70%, 75%. If it's a more touchy issue, 
Um, just as an example, like, uh, you know, one of the ballot measures last year regarding uh, late term abortions, that kind of comes down because people get a little more sensitive. But for good old local government, we want to hear from you. We may be going to the ballot. Now's the time to weigh in. Uh, typically, we get a really good response rate. And when they take the survey, because, you know, they're not dropping it off. And, um, you know, we would need a design. And we're happy, obviously, for all of you, if you want to throw a question in there or two, to cover a particular issue. But again, typically, it's around 70, 75%. It's been very good because they know where it's coming from. It's no, you know, uh, unknown. We got a name and a number. You want to know what this survey is about? You know, call, you know, call Mr. or Mrs. X, you know what I mean, um, in the communications or public uh, information shop. So. I, I think that sounds great. I, I want to keep it as simple as possible. I have found, you know, I have filled out a couple of these lately and just never finished them. Got through the first couple of questions that I thought were relevant. And then I'm like, I don't have time for this. So as absolutely, Mr. Ray. No, and I know pre we prefer people to read the actual ballot language because that's really what they're going to see when they open up their ballots. But I think right now we're, we're a little pre-ballot measure. Yeah. We're really trying to measure just broad support and measurement for all the things that Lori talked about as well as, uh, you know, Rick and the rest of staff, so. Excellent. Uh, other questions? Aaron. And what, what is your goal for completion with, given the, I don't know, around between 3,000 and 3,700 um, active yep. voters? What's your, what's your goal? Well, you know, Aaron, you know, in the past, we've, we've hit over 700. Um, the proposal set where I'm, I'm hoping to get 300, you know what I mean, as sort of the low level. But I would really think with, you know, the process that we do in, in, in notifying all the residents and voters, I, I think a threshold of 400 is very doable. We could get north of that even, um, you know, especially if you have advocates for, you know, the things that Lori leads and works on as well as in your community, the more people that know that this is coming. But like I said, over in Vail, you know, uh, you know, 700 is, is pretty darn good for a population very similar to yours of roughly 35, 3,700 voters, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions for David or Lori? I have one question for Lori. Lori, what is a realistic number? Say we wanted to get this thing um, passed. What's a realistic number that would be voting on something like this? Where, where, would, we, where would we put this? In what ballot uh, would, would it be like a town council election would it be in November or April or what how would we do this you know I, I think it's it's up to council to decide I mean we've been um, in, in our minds we've been targeting a local election in 2022 I think that's what we talked about last time we talked April but, well, you know, it's um, Jeffrey what we don't want to do the problem is every time we go to a county or a state, um, when we're teamed up, we're, we're competing against other questions. Yeah. And uh, that's what happened last time. And I think, I think we have much, this is a very much a local issue. And I think we have, I think our goal should be that we are, we are, our timeline and everything we're doing moving forward is the, is working towards the April 2022 uh, question ballot. And that's what we should be working towards. Okay. And with that, I think this is a great just first step understanding where the community is on the issue, getting those results and deciding how we go forward based on that data. And I think it's important that you guys understand like um, that the child care committee and staff definitely realize that this isn't um, the only work that we're going to have to do to do to get this passed. What we're really hopeful for is that this survey would be a good platform for us. It would be a good reason for us people to reach out to us and ask like, what's going on? What is the survey about childcare? And it'll help. We're definitely looking right now, the committee is very focused on um, finding people who are willing to be ambassadors or even just talk to people, you know, either in their HOA or in their neighborhood um, or in their community, you know, like, BGV or other business groups. So um, I actually think this is a really important additional step to be part of the um, educational package for our community. It'll educate us, but it's also going to educate them that this is coming up. Please make sure you do go vote in the April election because not everyone does. 
So I think that, you know, for all those reasons, this is an important step for us to take. Well said, Kelly. Other questions? Eric, I got dropped off with an internet problem earlier. Yeah, yeah. So we may have already talked about this, but have we discussed whether sales tax, property tax, or are we not there? I'm assuming we're not there yet. Is that a question that we would ask in this survey or are we just kind of getting the temperature of support at this point? No, I think the more that we can hear from the community about the different options, that will help us um, figure out what approach is going to work best. Um, so I definitely think it's something that we'll know more um, after we get the survey results. Okay. And I should say sales, property, or yeah. short-term rental. Yeah. Can I add just, yeah, absolutely, Dick. We typically will ask that, you know, for sort of this sort of benchmark survey, just typically people prefer sales to the property tax. If you have other revenue streams that you can, um, you know, perhaps look to reallocate to a dedicated source, you know, we understand there's a business community. We understand a lot of those things, um, but typically, um, you know, sales tax is, is more palatable typically because uh, they know out of town guests and visitors will pay a lot of that and it won't directly hit them. But again, uh, we can you know, test that generically, but I would just recommend if you don't ever want to go in with a survey and, and you're literally talking about rates, you know what I mean, and fishing around because the community typically let, it, it, sends, it can send a signal that it's like, they don't really know how much money they need for X and they're just fishing around to see what'll work. And you just you can have some you know, a pushback on that just from prior thing, projects that we've worked on. So. Um, we can definitely test that generically and any other funding uh, possibility or allocations in there. Um, so just wanted to add that. Excellent. Other questions? Uh, can we, Lori, see sort of the questions before they go out? Yes. Um, I think probably after we get David under contract, one of the first things we'll start doing is working on sort of what are the questions? Um, how many questions do we need to include and what do we want to really get to? So yeah, we'll be working on that the, the next few weeks or so um, yep. and get that back to you before anything would go live for sure and get your comments on it. Excellent. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, we're going to have multiple versions. I mean, again, not to speak for staff, but there's draft A, there's draft B, there's draft C. We want all input and uh, we also want to educate and inform respondents, especially about some of these issues that they're not aware of. So believe me, uh, we would never well, go into the field without, you know, we're like, here you go. Let me know yeah. by Friday, two o'clock. And by the way, it's, you know, six o'clock on Thursday. So, you know, it's we're going to have to make sure we're all educated enough too, because we'll be getting calls, I'm assuming, about the survey and, you know, explain this to me before I fill it out kind of thing. So, yep. We're going to help with that as much as we can. Excellent. All right. Uh, anyone and else? Lori, go ahead. Lori and Corey are already creating sort of a fact sheet or a speaking, you know, speaking points. And so we'll make sure that we share that with everybody on here and we can keep adding to it as people, you know, get certain questions over and over. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Speaking points. All right. Good enough. All right. Thank you, Lori. David, thanks for joining us Thank tonight. You. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Good to see you all. You guys have a good evening. You too. Okay. We have uh, events discussion, but I am going to talk about one other thing first. Yeah, Rick. Sure. Do we have a... Go ahead from everybody to move forward with the contract. Oh yeah, everybody contract with Magellan. Yeah. All, right. All right, very good. That's everything. Lori voted, Lori voted. <laughs> Lori, um, you know what, she's the most important vote on here, so. I love it. Hey, um, one, one thing, so I wanna make sure that the people that wanna be on for the events get on and we don't have that scheduled for, you know, another 20 minutes or so. Um, we could do a couple other matters too. Yeah, I just, I wanted to talk to the council about one thing, if you're amenable to it. Um, we ended up having a better 2020 than we had doom, doom said that we would. If you recall, we haven't given anybody a pay increase that works for the town. How would you guys feel about allowing Rick to, Rick and Shannon to sort of take a look at what we could possibly do um, to, you know, we know that Summit County and some of the other towns have done 
pay increase uh, increases during this time. I don't want us to fall behind. So if you guys just give Rick the thumbs up, we can have him come back to us with an idea of what, what he thinks we should do so we can, you know, face it, our employees have kicked ass during COVID and uh, we don't want to lose them. And we want to make sure they know that we value what they do. So how's everybody feel about letting Rick take a stab at that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And they have had to wear so many hats over the last few months. And I think it's, it would be really awful if they didn't realize financially how much we all appreciate and have benefited from that. Yeah, Eric, I appreciate you bringing that up. I couldn't agree more with us, you know, not, not rehiring or, or resisting rehiring. We've, like Kelly said, we really pushed them hard and added new things. And I mean, I can speak for the five star. I mean, the way everyone stepped up and worked over a weekend, it's just, the staff's been phenomenal. So I, I, I'm in full support of taking a look at that and bringing it back to us. Absolutely right. in agreement. Okay, Rick. Yeah, I, I really I appreciate that a lot. I think it's one of the things we know in this competitive market that we're in here on um, is that you know if we fall behind in these things, we just have to pay down the road later to catch up. And you know we have to be doing these market surveys every couple of years to make sure that we're we're staying in that. And so when you when you when you lose a year. Uh, you know, three or four percent, then it, it puts people behind. So I think, uh, to the extent that we can do that, I think it's a, it's the right thing to do, and I think it just helps protect us because we're already like everybody else out there. We're challenged. You know, we couldn't run the routes we wanted to run this year, and uh, and some other things. So, and we're struggling get, trying to get staff back in, even with rec right now, just so that we can get get open on Saturdays and get the pool open. Um, some of these people that have been furloughed and not around, you know, are not there <laughs> to come back. So um, it's the same thing we're seeing all over. But this is a step in the right direction. I think it's, uh, I think it's great and I appreciate it. So we'll bring something back either at the next meeting or the first meeting in March to you. Because um, we're in that 12 month period where nobody is getting increases and we'd like to get that done before May that's the end of that 12 month cycle that nobody has gotten any increase. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, council. Uh, can we take a quick five minute break before events, Rick? You good with that? Uh, oh yeah, of course. You bet. Okay. Quickie. See you guys back. Hi, bud. It's frozen on my screen, Rick, and I can't. I'll, I'll get to it before I leave tonight, though. All right. Uh, we are one, two, three, four, five, six. Who are we missing? Nobody. Oh, I got to count myself. We're not missing anybody. All right. <whistles> Rough day. Uh, let's get to our events discussion. Are we uh, inviting Todd and Lucy in? Hi, Todd. What did you use? Uh... Hi, Lucy. Hello. All right. Uh, who's Shannon? Are you going to kick this one off? All right. Yep. Have at it. Um, so I guess I will start by saying that originally um, Council had asked for Lucy and Todd to come and have a, a conversation around uh, like events philosophy. Um, so that was our original plan uh, up until early last week when after some thought and conversation with the events committee, we really decided that before we could have that kind of comprehensive discussion with you, we needed additional data. And we knew that Lucy was already planning for a resident sentiment survey, um, but she doesn't feel like right now is the, the best time to actually ask our community those questions. And, and she can certainly explain why that is, but we knew that would be 
kind of out a little ways. And so to have a philosophical discussion about events without that information just, you know, didn't really seem to make sense to us. So what we're planning to do today is instead of having a philosophical discussion with you, we want to have a process discussion with you. And our intent is to have that conversation with you today to talk about what kind of data and information you would like to see, see that would help inform your decisions and your um, kind of recommendations on how we move forward. And then also just to talk a little bit about timeline. Um, I did in the memo kind of give you a little bit of information on what we've been looking at so far, but hopefully it's just enough to kind of start your gears turning on, on what you'd like to see for that more in-depth discussion. And uh, our intent for that is to come back to you with a, like a special work session agenda that might be a couple hours long where we really dive into data and information that we have and then have that um, you know, much more robust philosophical conversation. So that's kind of our intent for today. And I'd like to kick it to Lucy. She's just gonna give you kind of a, an overview history of the strategy and of events um, up till now. Great, thanks Shannon. Um, I'll be brief. Um, we started the Breckenridge Events Committee back when um, Dick Carlton was on our board. And it was Dick's idea actually to start a community-wide um, group of event producers mainly to get ourselves organized. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? When are we doing it? Um, so that that's the genesis of the Breckenridge Events Committee. Um, we we ended up using the the strategies that the BTO had in place for why we do events, um, and and our strategies were adopted by the BEC. Um, Three, strat three core um, strategies. First one is branding, media, um, events that would fall under that category are things like snow sculpture event, Uller, do tour, pro challenge, the big ones we do primarily to generate media or um, brand positioning. The second strategy is building business. These are events that are built primarily during need periods or what used to be need periods. Um, examples there are a lot of the ones that happen in the fall, like Oktoberfest, the Wine Classic, Film Fest. Um, and then the third one is community and or goodwill. So that's stuff like the Duck Race, um, a lot of Westies events, town party, um, bike to work day, those kinds of things. So when we produce events, we um, most events check all three boxes at some level. But you hear us talk about our matrix in the matrix. We run all the events down a column and then we go across and we check what's the primary reason we did this thing. And then we evaluate against that. So something like snow sculpture, we'll, we'll evaluate what was the amount of media we got. Sure, there's probably some extra sales tax. Sure, there's some community goodwill, but we really did it for media. So we try to stay pretty disciplined with that across all of our events. And different producers evaluate a little, um, some more thoroughly than others, but, but that's the basic um, crux. Those three um, strategies are, uh, virtually every event fits under one of those three. Questions or comments on that part? I know, Dick, if you wanna throw something else in, it was, it was your idea back in the day. No, you summed it up well, Lucy. I, um... You know, an enormous amount of work has gone in by a bunch of people to, to get us where we are. So it's, I've got some more thoughts later, but I think they're more appropriate later. Okay. Thanks, Dick. Jen? Okay, um, so I think what we would like, and we're happy to answer any questions um, that you might have, but we'd love to hear your feedback on what would be helpful to you in the upcoming conversation. I, I was curious if there's a good understanding from the events um, people on if um, the town is really viewed 
like any event in any part of the town um, or if there are definitely like areas of the town that we should be breaking it into, you know, looking at how much should we have on Main Street in the river walk area versus things that are in Main Street Station or, you know, sort of not in the center of town that basically every person is affected by. I just don't have, I, you know, in reading all the comments that we've gotten over the past um, week or several weeks, and then also reading the, you know, the different wine fests and things. It seems like there's so much going on in Main Street Station, but I don't think we received a single comment about any of those. And so I feel for me, there's a disconnect as far as knowledge of are things that are happening in Main Street Station affecting or, you know, positively or negatively viewed by our community. Dick. Yeah, Kelly, I, you know, the one exception is, is the alcohol events. I, I'm not sure people realize where they're coming from, but, you know, when they let out at six o'clock or whatever, and they all pour into town after inviting all afternoon, you know, it's an impact that people realize, but they're not maybe sure where it came from. Um, Shannon, to your question, what else do we need? I, I would lo love to see us just do a complete kind of clearinghouse examination of all of the events, you know, see if maybe we can engage the Summit Foundation and Jeannie to, to look at all nonprofit fundraising events, you know, major, we'd have to have some threshold there, you know, that happened in, in, in Breckenridge, um, the BCA events and major installations, you know, that they may do um athletic events all of westies events which most of them go through sepa so they're already captured but any major tournaments you know if um you know if we're going to do a big you know ultimate frisbee tournament out at the out at the turf field or or a big hockey tournament or you know it's just just anything that's going to have impacts on town and, and that kind of thing skiery events you know, whether or not they have in-town activation, you know, the scary events that have the in-town activation we tend to get, but if they don't, you know, and again, there's gotta be a level of magnitude there where, where they hit the radar. Um, but we're getting a lot of those, but I don't know that we're getting all of those. So, you know, it would be great to, to get that data to really look at it. And, and then to take it a little further and, and look at the systems that we're using, you know, Lucy touched on it, the events committee, you know, we, we really charged ourselves with the need to, to organize the events and, and um, you know, and, and, and to, to, I, to, to vet them based on the criteria at the time and um, everything else. But, you know, I, I kind of look at the events committee. It, it, it's really functioning well. We've got an incredible group of events people on it and driving it. But has, have we outgrown it? Is it time to have that committee um, function a little differently and, and bring in some non-events people to participate and more community people to participate in bring the voice of the community to that table just around impacts and that kind of thing. Cause I, I think it would be good education, good give and take for both groups. You know, I, I think so often the community, we get frustrated and people um, express concern about events, but you know, they don't necessarily know all of the, the, the bigger picture and, and vice versa. So um in any, you know, any of the other systems that we have in place um, currently to to vet and look at these type things, have we have, you know, we've 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 evolved a lot and changed a lot, and and COVID has, as we said, given us a chance to to do a bit of a reset, and you know, I think we want to look at at everything and have everything in front of us for, in the process. Yeah, that's great comments, Dick. I. 
um, actually asked Jeannie at our last resiliency meeting for just that, because outside of this larger discussion, I have a real fear that when October comes this year, everybody's gonna try to jam in every event that they have not been able to do. So we need a master list of everything that's going on so that everybody's just not tripping over each other. And this is all for naught then because you know, everybody's trying to make up on fundraising, et cetera, and sports and everything all at once. So it's important to get that matrix of every single thing that goes on um, for the larger events discussion, but then also just coming out of the gate. You know, on, on the private events, the only really st say that we have in those, the only leverage is, um, is, is liquor licenses, correct? correct. I mean, if, correct. So, and, so on that. And, the, and not even that good of a, I mean, we're, we really don't have that much leverage. Well, we do have potentially, Jeffrey, and we've talked to Shannon about having Helen come to talk to us when the time is right. What other things can we put onto those um, event organizers to make the impacts to town less severe? So if somebody's having a booze centric event on private property that they're gonna end at seven or eight o'clock at night, can we say to them, you're gonna need a hundred security people then? You know, those are the kind of things I think we need to figure out where our leverage is and what we can do to, if we can't stop them, we can at least mitigate what happens in the community then. And can we do the same thing for <clears throat> sustainability, recycling, requiring requiring a, uh, a zero waste event? I mean, hopefully we should do that on our own events as well. But yeah, can we do that? Is, is that part of our purview? Jeffrey, it you is. know, that's, that's already part of the events committee. But I, you know, in, in my earlier comments, I think we can broaden the, the scope of that. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, take what we've learned in the events committee in in the zero waste world and and to to expand it to our non our nonprofit fundraisers and in our you know youth sports tournaments and everything else that we do in town. And I believe SEPA is another way that we um, I mean we don't need to approve the events either, and um, that is a way that um, at least at least when I was on the events committee, that was another way to track the sustainability um, of an event as well. I, I do have a question with SEPA in this memo. It says that seven alcohol, wait a second now, um, at the river walk, all but one required a SEPA. So what was the one the, event that did not require one? Still on the hill because it's, it was all indoors. So if you have an event that's all indoors, it doesn't require a SEPA. Okay. Um, which, you know, part of our evaluation and we've already started to look at the ordinance that governs SEPA as well as the rules and regulations to take a hard look at what the criteria is um, for approving a SEPA permit and where our um, current uh, ability lies in denying a permit and and I think that's we'll be having some more conversations about potentially making those more robust. Um, I see Helen popped up but and you certainly ask her some questions. I will just say that from the alcohol licensing perspective, that is a very, very narrow um, purview as far as what can be denied. And so our, ability to deny a permit is going to be more robust on the SEPA end than it will be on the liquor licensing side of things. Um, the state doesn't give a lot of flexibility in that. And even in um, you know, the parameters we put around an event to make sure that it's meeting our criteria, whether that's police or barricades or sustainability, that will all fall on that SEPA side of things. Um, Helen, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think I think you spoke very clearly about that. It's just that liquor, well, and we're preparing something for you from the liquor authority perspective um, or liquor licensing perspective, but liquor um, is really driven by the state and the state rules and regs around liquor permits are very limited in what you can deny a permit for. 
Um, the other thing to consider is that we have both special event liquor permits and then we also have um, we also have events that just expand their current liquor licenses for the event and those are those don't actually come through a special event liquor permit process. So um, we'll put this together, we'll bring it to you. You've seen it, some of you saw this a couple of years ago when this came up the first time. Um, so it might look familiar, but um, we'll, we'll brief all of you who haven't seen that and get you the right information. We so have... what Helen's talking about is in 2018, um, council asked to see what, how many uh, special liquor licenses were issued and they did a really great multi-page memo on the numbers that were issued and then the events that they were actually issued for. So as part of what we come back to you with during that next work session, um, it will be a look back, I can, I'll reiterate what they gave to you in 2018 and then they'll do the same thing for 2019 so that you get a really good picture of what was issued for those types of permits, as well as who, who is asking for the permit. Um, because as um, Eric said, you know, a lot of these events are tied to nonprofits. So we wanna make sure we give you kind of a really complete picture of what that looks like when we come back to, to chat with you again. You know, and on, the, on the other side, as far as we've got a lot of emails about this for, for months, really, <clears throat> since we started talking that we might be revisiting it. it are we going to kind of compile the feedback um, and have it kind of a succinct, uh, a, a succinct spreadsheet of what the issues are and, and what the, the, those that responded, what their thoughts are? I mean, anecdotally, what, what, my, what my friends and my circle of, uh, of my sphere of acquaintances are is, a lot of people expect the town to be busy. It's just because it is busy so often. And I think we can do stuff with making it more sustainable, making it better enforced and, and all that. But what I, I see people kind of pushing back on is that normally, though the town can be crazy, we can have our little sphere of, uh, of, of nature to ourselves or with with other people uh, that you know like-minded people this last summer has been a real kind of wake-up call where uh, uh, you know our trail has have been packed probably from from covid but i would like to find out where the biggest concern or the biggest complaints are when it comes to is it in town or is it in on our on our open space and i mean i think we might you know maybe some people think well maybe we should make some sacrifices early on to get the economy back up and running and then back off. So I, I'd like to hear, you know, kind of all that, a, a schematic of what people's thoughts are. And piggybacking on that, I think we got a lot of great um, letters to council that gave color and just hearing what people were thinking, but I'm glad we're taking this approach where right now we're debating process and we'll come back with more data. So we truly understand what the climate around the vents is from the community survey, having a larger data set to, um, to make the decision. And also I think there's a combination of maybe misperceptions. Right now town is busy. We have, um, our mud seasons are gone and I don't think that's because of events in October. I think there were two SEPA permits. Um, so just making sure we have a accurate view of what the current climate is. Jeffrey, to your point on open space, um, before our next meeting, I'd love to get BOSAC input on what they think about events on open space and trail. Um, otherwise, Shannon, I think in the packet, it mentioned that we'll have some way to map the financial and economic impact. I think that's a really important consideration. Um, and along with that, who are the event producers? Are they local event producers? They're staying in the community, the money's staying in the community. Or are they third parties from out of town making a ton of money and leaving? I think those are the type of events that we wouldn't necessarily want to prioritize. Um, but also going back to where are our teeth, what can we enforce either in guidelines, requirements, um, some sort of management of the events? It'd be great to know sustainability. What can we do there? Is there any inclusivity guidelines? Just different things we can use. I think Todd said repeatedly, events can be a tool. How can we use events as a tool to advance 
town's values and also a tool for the mechanics of crowd dispersion and other things like that. Yeah, I, um, I love what you're saying, Carol, about using them as a tool and um, pushing inclusivity and sustainability. Um, with, with that and a bit with what Jeffrey said, I wonder since, um, since you're looking for what information to gather, I'd love to see what events locals embrace and locals feel a part of. I don't know how we would get that information per se, but I do, I, I do wonder if that would help us a bit to see what, um, where locals, where our residents feel welcome, um, because that seems to be, you know, where where we're hearing complaints. <clears throat> but also, if if events are not driving people to come here as much, or we don't need them to drive people to come here as much, to Carol's point, then maybe that should be weighed a little bit more heavily about what what events are welcome to people who live here. Um, Aaron, to that point, well, and, and actually to a few of the comments that have been made um, in the line of process, um, I, it might be helpful for us. We have a ton of this data already from the last resident survey. There's a whole lot of things that answer the questions that you've been asking. And then we also have some business surveys that we do after the big Main Street events and things. So perhaps it would be helpful if we kind of condense that down so you can see what we already have, what we have gathered in the past and see if that is what you're looking for now. Um, and maybe we, we update it with some more DEI stuff, a little more sustainability because the last one was done two years ago um, and, and see if that's what you want or if you want some additional things that we haven't ever asked before because they are pretty big data sets that we have. So it might be helpful for you all to see that and I'll figure out how um, maybe we do it in the next BEC meeting, Todd, we'll look at what we have and then figure out how to present that succinctly for you all to look at to say, okay, this is pretty much it. Just add these couple things over here. Or if you wanna clean slate it and really go down it an entirely different path, that's fine too. We would get about um, these resident surveys, you know, we typically in the last year, we've gotten about 11, 1200 people responding. So um, it's Great. really broad. Um, and then just to piggyback on that, um, and uh, something that Carol mentioned on the open space piece, um, one of, and I don't think I put this in my memo, so I apologize if I'm repeating, um, BOSAC was also planning to do a survey, a community survey in the spring. And given that we're doing a resident sentiment survey, a child care poll, and then looking at a BOSAC survey, we thought it'd probably be helpful, one, not to have so many. Um, and then two, that there's probably some synergy in the open space questions and the resident sentiment survey. So we've had a conversation with Ann Lowe. She's gonna join the small committee that's gonna review the resident sentiment survey so we can get some open space questions on there. Um, so I think that's going to be really helpful to kind of looking at that big picture of not just events that are happening in the core of town, but what's also happening on our, our trails and how do people feel about that. So I just wanted to clarify that we were merging those things together and we do have that input from Anne. Just, you know just so everybody really knows that the trail issue is every um, town like ours in, the, in probably in the country right now, but in the West. At our last cast meeting, it was a big topic of discussion. There was a um, to people from the Forest Service showing just how terrible things have gotten at some of the places in Moab um, with trash and you know human waste. Some problems that we don't have, but we're not the only ones. Virtually every cast town has overwhelming numbers on you know 14ers and trailheads, and you know hopefully some of those issues are COVID only. And once we go back to more normal life, people will drift back to their, their other things. However, I'm not totally sold that that's gonna happen. I think some people have discovered that being outside on the trails is cooler than being inside in a rec center and they're gonna continue to do that. So I think for the trail use part, there's gonna be a, a mitigation effort piece that, that BOSEC's really gonna need to 
to take on? How are we going to start dealing with things better like the whole poop fairy thing? You know, those things are just getting worse and us just saying do the right thing is not helping, obviously. So that, that will be a completely different discussion outside of this for, for BOSEC, I think, is how are we going to start mitigating these impacts on our trails? Because it's, you know, obviously it's here. You know, you know what I found really helpful? Totally agreed. Um, it's just it's the it's the 2019 events kind of a calendar uh, of of what the dates of the events kind of running down uh, in 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 order and it uh, it's it's pretty enlightening and and a little bit frightening as well. You know, down the same lines of what Eric was talking about, I I'd be curious, Lucy Shannon, if. If any other communities are have have gotten a grip around virtual events, you know, like Strava races and that kind of stuff, and you know, I know we touched on it a while ago, and I don't know that we really came to any conclusion, but um, you know, I'd love to keep the radar up to see if any other communities are are because um, because I think that's that's the way of the future. You know, people will use our assets for events, virtual events. And, you know, how can we, you know, how can we manage that um, going forward? Be another piece to kind of bring to the table for process discussions. Hey, Rick, can we put that out as one of those cast questions? You know how Margaret has questions that she forwards every once in a while from communities? Yep. That'd yeah. be great. And we did pass, we did pass something about how those virtual events still need to go through a SEPA process if it involves so many people, right? We have something. So maybe with what Dick is saying, we could check in to see how it's going. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that could be a starting, by. Yeah. That could be a starting place and just see, you know, just keep an eye on best practices from others. Yeah, I think that's great. Okay, so what other information do we want for this larger events discussion? You know, something I'd like to see is what can we do, some ideas from the events group, of what can we do to the events that we currently have that are iconic that pose some issues? For instance, Saturday of Oktoberfest. How can we keep Oktoberfest, Friday and Sunday seem to be regulated, fun. Saturday is a complete nightmare. What can we do about Saturday so we can keep Oktoberfest yet will that, you know, fix it maybe or, or fix some of the problems. Also, um, you know, how do we feel about impacts to the historic district when we do stuff on Main Street and everybody parks all through the district? I don't really know how those residents feel. You know, maybe 4th of July people are cool with it, but I'd like to know how do the people that live in the historic district, in particular, Harris High Ridge, Briar Rose feel about those impacts on some of these event days when we close Main Street and we, you know, people are parked just willy nilly. And some of that we're gonna be able to rectify with our new parking structure, don't forget. But I still would like to know, you know, some of these things, maybe we can continue with the events that we have if we just make some tweaks to the operational aspect of it. So I'd like to hear some of that in the in that discussion. Um, anything else? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Todd. I was just gonna say one, one concern I had that Eric kind of brought up about October, and I actually think it's already moved up to September is kind of this like event loading for the fall. You know, we've already heard the Ram Walks, you know, planning to move to September, their golf charities moving to September. So I, I think as we see, um, as we see the summer be crazy busy with trailhead usage, we're going to see loading there in town. And then I think we're going to see tremendous loading with events. So just got some concerns there on what the fall is going to look like from an events perspective and what sort of strategy the council would want us to try and shape there. Make sure it doesn't happen. <laughs> So that's actually, I think, a really good segue um, into our 
kind of final question, which is how do you feel about our timeline, which I threw out as 60 to 90 days? Um, do you feel like, I mean, we need some time to get the resident survey out. Um, I think Lucy would like to wait just a little bit until we're maybe out of this COVID feeling that we're still in. We keep thinking there's light at the end of the tunnel. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, so we'd like to get a little closer to people feeling like we're at the end um, or closer to the end. So does that sound good to you all? Do you feel like you need to see something sooner? Um, how do you all feel about that? The only thing is I, I know that you already talked about this and you're well aware, but I am really hoping we can create some separation with the child care um, survey. So I'm a little concerned that if this goes out first and the child care comes right after, people will just be like, I already took this survey and delete it. So if there's a way to get the child care to go out first, mm -hmm. then, <laughs> then I'm less you know, concerned. Here's what I would say, Kelly. I, I think there are people that really care about the event stuff. You can see how many letters we, we received. I don't know that we have to do a traditional survey to get the information we want. You know, I think, I think we could do something more, um, in, invite people in to take the survey, not bombard everybody's phone, but really put it out there. Hey, we wanna know, sort of like we've been doing, we wanna know what you think, go to the town's website, there's a link, take our event survey. And I think we would get the people that really care um, about these things would, would go ahead and and take it. And then we can save the bombarding and the phone survey for, you know, what we do. Um, in the meantime, you know, our survey for events can definitely go out to everybody in the BTO sphere as far as residents. And, you know, even some guests would be great to get some of that info too, if we're going to do something like that. But I agree with you, Kelly. I don't want to, I don't want to over survey everybody either. See, I, I, I kind of feel like we want a broader view um, and um, a deeper dive around this. This is our, our chance to really reach out. We've got the community engaged around events. Let's, let's, uh, you know, seize the opportunity to get input about everything. It, you know, this, this whole COVID reset and how it's affected everyone in our town. And, you know, cause I think there's greater, concerns around sense of community and, and, and character, you know, town character. And I mean, I think there, there are a lot of concerns out there, even beyond events. And um, I really like Lucy's thought of really doing a, a um, you know, resident, um, you know, sense of, of quality of life. And, and uh, you know, it does really a, almost a second dive of the destination management plan process, similar um, of that level of a survey, and and I think it'll take long enough to really get it together and to to get it out. Where I think Kelly, if childcare moves quickly, I I I would hope that you could be well ahead of the other one. I don't know what you think about that, Lucy. Dick, don't you think that we have a ton of community sentiment surveys from that original deep dive, though? See, one of my worries right now is if we survey a ton of stuff right now, people feel like, well, we haven't been doing anything. Maybe we should start doing stuff. I'd really like to, I'd like to look at the stuff that Lucy offered up that was pre-COVID, when people were really feeling event fatigue. To, to get, you know, some of those sentiments is really what I'd like to look at. I'm afraid right now people are like, I, there are times I really hate parts of Oktoberfest. Right now, I'd love to go to Oktoberfest. Normally I wouldn't, but today I really would because I haven't done anything in a year. So, you know, I, I'd really like to see that earlier information. Well, yeah, I, think... I, I totally agree. I think people are just weird right now. One way or the other, they're not used to seeing people and, or they're, yeah, they can't wait to see people. Like, I just don't feel like people are, and, and they're afraid that things will never go back to normal. And so when we say, hey, we might cut back on some events, they're, you know, they're scared. And so I agree, if there's any way that we can use the information that was pre-COVID, I think it would be more accurate.
How does everybody else can, feel about it? We package that up for you so you all can see it again and then decide what in addition, you know, we would ask those same questions again in this resident survey. And then with anything additional that you, like I think the virtual events, that yeah. wasn't even a thing two years ago. So there's nothing right. on that. You know, we will we'll do that. But I think it will be helpful for you to see what we already have, you know, so you can see again, what we asked before and what people said, and then uh, just kind of adjust it for um, today, right? So is there, I was kind of imagining, um, we've been talking a lot, Dick and I have been talking with Wendy and she's been using these um, words like the grand, the great reset or the grand reset. And so in my mind, I was imagining um, something that was gonna take us kind of a year to work out and figure out like exactly where we wanna be. So I'm just wondering, am I wrong? A, like, are we in sort of, no, we really should do this in the next few months and it really shouldn't take us that much longer. I could be wrong. But I'm almost wondering if, you know, if there's something to get us started with these pre-surveys, but then to Dick's point, we probably need to do more. I mean, I think we have m new questions. I think as we move forward with some of these bigger lists and calendars that show us all the different things that are going on, I think it's going to be a discussion for quite some time. And so maybe in October, God willing, we're open to some level of like gatherings and regular normalcy and normal events. Maybe October, November and December next year, maybe that would be a good time to produce. Maybe it's a survey, maybe by then we come up with a, you know, a different outlook. But I'm just wondering, I guess the timing on this because I was seeing it as a really kind of a long-term look. And am I wrong with that? And if so, then you know, maybe we can revisit the survey in the future. I did not think this would be that long-term, Kelly, because I think we have a, a much shorter window um, because there's gonna be stuff that happens at the end of this summer, I feel like. And yeah, absolutely. But I feel like, I feel like, you know, some of these might be decisions we have to make this year, but maybe we're like over the next year, we're really putting the building blocks in place that will help us make decisions into the future. Yeah, I don't disagree. Maybe I'm thinking that, too big. One, one, of my, one of my concerns with that is the minute you allow an event this year, you just put that in concrete. That event now owns that time, which is, which is why this overload of events in October really worries me. You know, with, I'm afraid that if, if all this stuff jumps into that month, that stuff's all going to say, well, you know, we're sort of grandfathered in here. We got to do our event last year we get to do it this year. So that, that's a real concern. And that's why I think we need to move a little speedier than. But we're talking, I mean, we're not gonna have new events popping up this year. We're gonna have people who usually have their event in May asking to be in October because that's the first available position. And so we'll just tell them, look, this because of COVID and because we want your nonprofit to succeed, of course, we're gonna work with you every way we can. But in the future, you'll need to be going back to your May spot. I mean, I, I don't imagine we're going to have enough weekends or days or venues to be having new events this year. So I don't really um, think that there's not a way we could manage that situation. You want to bet? And I think that's a role <laughs> for the events committee where, where they can, you know, I mean, I hear you, Eric, there's entitlement you know, the second that, that an event is approved. But, uh, you know, I just think we're really clear with them on all events that we're doing this this deep dive and really, you know, doing a, a self look at what we're doing with events and, and uh, you know, what, what was good yesterday may not be good tomorrow. And, you know, I just make sure everyone understands that because we want to do a thoughtful process and, have, you know, get as much input as possible and, and uh, um, you know, make the right long-term calls and set up the systems to support it. And, and, and you know, you know the Debbie Downer in me just wants to point out, I, I, I think it's very possible that we're not, you know, that, that October, November, 
we're going to yeah. be not in the same situation we are right now, but in a situation where, where crowds are still going to make us feel hanky. And, and so, I mean, I, hopefully you know, think things will, will progress, but looking at the numbers that we had today with COVID, you know, I mean, in, in the rollout of, of vaccines at other parts of the country that, you know, that those are the same people that be coming here. I, you know, I don't want to be Pollyanna on this thing and think that this is, uh, this is behind us. I, I think it's, it's going to be a year before we really well, feel comfortable. And Jeffrey, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, if we don't want October to be loaded with events, I mean, we, we don't have to, right? Like, can't we say, I, I don't feel comfortable planning on events in October at this point. We don't have a lot of information to say that that's a possibility. I mean, what is the process right now for all of that? Are people signing up and um, they're just planning on October? Because we can control that too. Can we? So a um, couple things to Eric mentioned earlier that he brought up in the resiliency committee last week, a need to have a kind of a really complete matrix of people who are th even thinking about having an event this year. And so Sarah at BTO is putting that together and um, we'll be having those conversations about exactly what you've all said. I mean, I don't think we can guarantee as we sit here today, knowing what COVID looks like that we don't know what October, November, September, whatever, what that's actually gonna look like yet. And so, um, you know, I think anything that anyone even talks about is somewhat tentative. Um, and, I, you know, I think we have a plan to communicate that to people as well. So as I was listening to you, I think what I'd like to ask is um, maybe that we schedule time with you and, and pull together all as much of this information that you've asked for. We pull that together for you. Um, we talk with the BEC and take a look at that DMP cert resident sentiment survey that was already complete. And like Lucy said, distill that down into something that's succinct that we can also present to you at the same time. Then we can have that conversation about um, where we are this year and whether or not based on the information you have, you think you need, need or want more information, or if you think you have enough, that you can give us direction on how we go forward. And maybe that's, here's how we want you to go forward for the next year. Um, and we wanna revisit this for future planning or you say, okay, here's our short-term plan and here's what we'd like to see for a long-term philosophy. But maybe before we can kind of nail down what that looks like, we need to have that bigger conversation with you with additional information with the whatever it was, 2018, 2017 um, survey information that Lucy already has in her hands, then make some decisions on, on what you wanna see and if you need more. Um, does that sound like a good next step? It does. Okay. All right. Um, so, Shannon, yeah, sorry, Dennis. No, you're good. If we have the ability and we are looking at a complete reset, do we have the ability or the authority to take a block of time and say, there's no events here? Lucy? Yeah, Dennis, I think that's, um, you know, certainly a conversation that we can have with Tim Barry on that. And then I think it'll come into play on the private versus public piece um, and some of the events that we, um, maybe can't control. Um, but generally speaking, I think we have enough um, teeth in the seep as it currently exists. And we're going to talk about what we might want to put in there for additional teeth and, and whether or not we can put something in there that says we won't permit any events in October or something like that. But that is definitely something we'll take a look at bring and back to you. What I ask is that I've heard it several times is that we have no break at all from events. We look at the mm -hmm. iconic events. Absolutely. I, I love having those in town. But there's a, a small contingent of locals that just want a break. Um, mm -hmm. So don't know if it's possible. Yep. There are 
are some months that have no events. Um, <coughs> so I think, you know, mapping that out for people will be helpful too. Yeah, I think you're right, Lucy. I think just stating it and showing it is a big piece of this. Right. There's definitely an education piece with, with some of this stuff. And Dennis, just to jump in real quick here, um, totally understand that perspective and that lens. And I think for the events committee, having a definition from council on what you want town to feel like, and, and, and I think it goes back to Jeffrey's comments on open space and how walkable Maine feels and the animation from BCA. So a vision on what you want town to feel like. And then I think the events can be strategically ramped up or down to, to hit whatever you want from the event side. And that's just one leg of the stool that, that works together with open space, walkable main, the ski area and all those things. So I think if, if we get clarity on where you wanna go, we can, we can, yeah, we can carve out October or we can say, hey, September's nonprofit events time at the Riverwalk or whatever you would like. Good explanation, thank you. Okay, if that, if you guys are good, then um, Todd, Lucy and Carol and I will get working on this and figure out a time to come back to you. Awesome, anybody have anything else to add? Thanks for your work on that. Seems like a very overwhelming task. It does. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now to the favorite part of the evening, the COVID update. Rick, Mr. COVID, what do you got? <laughs> well, I'm gonna rely on Shannon to help me with this because um, I think you know, probably the, the biggest news of what we're dealing with is the, uh, the new dial metrics, right? Uh, we sat on a, uh, there was kind of a data boot camp yesterday. I know Aaron was on there and somebody else. Carol, was it you or? Carol, Carol was on there. Um, they, they went into a little detail about how it works. Basically, it's a rolling seven days of the, the, the previous seven days. You add up the number of uh, positive cases during that period and then uh, they multiply it times 3.2, which is, uh, you know, that's our difference in the per 100,000. When you look at our population and then that gives you your incidence per 100,000 um, that we have. And so, you know, you if, if you know, you know, it gives you a rough idea of where we're at. Obviously we have to stay below 500 uh, for level orange and if we, do that through Friday, then uh, our five-star businesses will move to level yellow. Uh, depending on number, Rick? what is that? What number do we have to stay at? Uh, we guess well, we have to stay below. Um, is it below ten, Shannon, on positivity? Yeah. We have to stay below five hundred on the incidence per hundred. Yeah. Between three hundred and five hundred. Okay. So, but if we do that this week, if we don't have any big, I think the last one were like 417 or something, but if we stay um, through Friday, then effective Saturday restaurants can operate that are five-star certified or other businesses that are five-star certified can operate in level yellow. So um, for some businesses, depending on how you're laid out, it, does it make a huge difference um, because it's still that number of 50, whichever, you know, it's, instead of 20, it's 20, now an orange is 25% or 50, right? Whichever is less and, and yellow, it's 50% it's, uh, or 50, but whichever is less. So, you know, you know that's, that number of 50 is kind of holding most places uh, to not big increases. So, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, Shannon, what was the other things, if any, we were going to go over? Uh, the worker rental relief and the business rent relief. All right, great. Yeah. Um, so the deadline closed for January for the business uh, program um, from Corey, 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 
Corey, why don't you pop on real quick? I'm here. There you go. Give them, uh, I could pull your email up here, but I mean, I got to tell you, uh, my hat is off to Corey and all the work that she has done. She has just scrambled like crazy, uh, constantly, constantly reaching out and trying to get these businesses to apply and educate them and, and uh, up to the 11th hour on most of these things, still trying to pull people in. So uh, thank you for doing that, Corey, and uh, your work is really nice. But we uh, give them an update on where we landed in January, what we've done in February so far, and where we're at with the small uh, business relief program through the county. Sure. So January, we ended up with 78 businesses total that were approved for money. Um, the total amount we paid out was $249,763. Um, February, again, was a little bit different because we had to evaluate businesses that would um, hopefully be eligible for the state dollars and then offered businesses that were not eligible for that program a second round of rent relief. So we we paid out yesterday for the February rent relief for the businesses that are not part of the state program. That ended up being 49 total businesses um, at $140,144. Um, and so for the, that's the, the town program and what has been paid out total. The small business relief uh, just closed at midnight last night for Breckenridge. Um, we ended up with 46, or sorry, 47 um, submitted applications. 36 of them have already been deemed as approved, at least from our, our internal evaluation. Um, and then we will meet, we, those will be sent to the, um, to the county uh, to determine how much everybody will receive. There are still nine um, applications that required a little bit further review with our finance team. We are working through that. Those will be completed by tomorrow and included with uh, everything else for the county. We did decline two applications so far. One was over um, the maximum amount uh, for gross sales, which is 2.5 million. And then one was not headquartered in Colorado, which was a requirement for the state program. We'll know, I think by Friday, which level, how much will be paid out at each tier from the state. And then we'll be able to evaluate if um, there's any town dollars that will be added to those applications approved through the state program. So as a reminder, those businesses that are applying under small business relief are not eligible to apply also for our February relief, but we will supplement that to make sure that they're not losing any money that they would have got from the town. So, uh, but my guess is they'll be pretty close to whole because, you know, there's a half million dollars countywide to be distributed. So um, we'll see what that looks like. Hey, Corey, what is our total since the beginning of COVID that we have put out for business relief and then um, personal rent relief? Do you have a total total? And an hey. estimation is fine. I mean, the, the original program, we paid out 900,000. Um, and then at least for the, the businesses. And then we did the restaurant, which I think was around 250,000. So we're probably now going to be around 1.6, 1.7 million, somewhere on there for business. I didn't manage the, um, the residential, so I don't have those numbers. Okay. Um, Eric, I think before we finished January business relief and before we did any February, the two combined were about 3.1 million. Um, and so now I would guess we're probably about three and a half million. Okay. That'd be a good number to get. I think it's important for the public to know, you know, what, what we have done um, as COVID relief. You know, we So you will, Eric, that's also part of your appropriations package that you'll be acting upon because all of the okay. 2020 dollars have to be appropriated by you. They were outside of the budget. And then obviously some of these now are going to be 21 appropriations, but we're working through 
a finalizing that appropriations list to look at all of the things that we added. Okay. Uh, not only business, but everything that was approved to create a sledding hill and every other outdoor activity that we did uh, in 2020 and any expenses related to walkable Maine and all those things that, that were all, uh, you know, not as part of the town budget. So I'd love to get those numbers so that when I am on a phone call with, you know, with Congressman the Goose that I can, you know, as, as they're fighting for, uh, money for for state and local governments you know he he likes to have these stories from his communities where we can say look we've spent four million dollars just in covid related relief and expenditures and we've gotten four hundred thousand dollars so far from the fed that that's the money that we would we'd like to get some backfill on that so um that'd be great yeah because what you allocated and what we actually uh, I mean, what you approved and then what we allocated is two different numbers. So right. We'll, okay. We'll that. And then do you want me to do a quick update on worker rental? Yeah. Um, so FERC has spent all of the money that we've allotted to them so far. There were 642 individuals with a connection to FRAC, so they were either living or working here that were assisted by FERC. 326 of those were served by town dollars. So right now, FERC has another 270,000 in DOLA funds that they can use for all residents of Summit County. So they're focusing on utilizing any federal and state funds that they have before they come back and ask any of the municipalities for any additional funding. Um, basically what Brianne asked is she just like would like to keep a conversation going with us um, and she'll let us know if she feels like they need some additional town funding we'll bring that request back to you at that time. Um, she also put out a survey to individuals who've received relief already um, just trying to figure out if they're still in the county have they left um, and if they have left why did they leave so she'll give us the results of the, that survey when it's complete. Um, I did hear her give a, a short update last week at one of our EOC meetings, and it sounded like the majority of people who had responded to that point were still here in Summit County. So that's really good news. That's awesome. I think the other thing we wanna monitor closely is what is gonna come out of this relief package the 1.9 trillion. And I know there's a considerable chunk of money earmarked for restaurants and other things. So what other things are gonna be out there that we need to continue to help and guide uh, the businesses toward those, uh, those funds? Um, because there is gonna become a lot of money available through things. And I mean, we're learning that we're gonna get a big chunk of money for transit. So. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Shannon, do we have a, a sense as far as our numbers, where you saw today 21 new cases uh, today. You know, and I tried to click on the, the uh, county site, which gives you kind of the demo of, uh, of the infected people. Is it still 20 to 40 year olds that are the, the most likelihood to get in, uh, infected? Yeah, I think it's still the younger folks right now. Okay. I don't suppose there's anything we could do about that as far as public uh, public outreach. I'm not sure, Jeffrey. I think we've we've tried to exhaust every possible educational opportunity. I think the county has done a really good job, especially lately with trying to reach out to Spanish speaking. Um, there was some conversation last week about trying to do more with the French speaking population in the county. So I think they're really trying hard to get the message out to everyone. Um, and Haley, I think it was last week, she devoted a lot of our social media time to COVID precautions. I just, I think people are, they're tired and fatigued with the whole thing. You know, I think if there's anything we should be doing is continuing to push the message that people need to stay home when they're sick, um, because they have had a significant number of cases that they've contact traced. 
that have shown that employees have gone to work when they were symptomatic. So, um, you know, if we can continue to talk about that and spread that message, that would be helpful. But beyond that, I'm not sure what else to do, to be honest. It's the you. nature of the, uh, of the youthful beast. Um, it, it's tough. I mean, I, I will tell you from being a frontline worker, it is, I am bone weary from telling people to pull the mask over their nose, from arguing with them about walking by every sign that explains what to do. It is death by a thousand cuts right now. Just it, people are so, they're just so over this whole thing. And our frontline workers in town are the ones that are putting up with us right now. They're dealing with people from out of state that, you know, a lot of people still do not believe that this is a real thing. And I talk to these people on a daily basis. They don't believe it's real. They believe it's overblown. They don't understand why we have this mask ordinance. What, you know, well, in my state, we can do whatever we want. Well, you're not in your state. And, you know, early on, if you remember, we really made a push to, to get that information out. And, you know, I would say, honestly, you know, if Lucy's still listening, before March, we probably need to do that again. Um, because we're just, we're sort of back to a point where, you know, people are either giving up because they're just tired of it, or they still just don't believe in the whole thing. So, you know, even though some of the people that don't believe in it were the ones that cut the line to get the vaccine the first time. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. you figure that one out. Anyway, it has been... It has been a tough couple of weeks lately, I think for for all of our frontline workers. And I, you know, I don't know what we can do, what kind of message we can send out again to say, you know, back off. Do not yell at the girl that's get making your coffee. Not don't yell at the guy at the retail store that's just doing his job. Um, but I am just personally frustrated. It's it's been very difficult lately. Do you think, is there something else that we can do for our frontline workers to help su support, I, like make them I think feel supported at all? I think messaging is a big deal. I think it worked the last time. I think people that were coming here understood the gravity of what Breckenridge is doing. And I think we've just got, you know, you've, I mean, this thing's been going on for what, 14 years now we've been in COVID? You know, that's, I mean, I, I just, I think we need to push that again because the people that are going to come here in March are, you know, they're Jeffrey's people. They're the 20 somethings that they don't necessarily believe this. They're coming from states that don't have the same measure of safety protocol that we do. And that that's where things will get difficult again for our frontline workers. So you know, if, if Lucy can, if we can get those messages out again that we pushed earlier, I think that would go a long way for the people that work in this town. Is there, is there any resources for, I mean, are we, do we know what colleges are coming on certain spring break times of the, of the, of the, uh, of the spring? Is there any outreach that that can, uh, we can avail ourselves of that? I'm assuming Lucy and her team have all that information. Yeah. Yeah, they, they generally do. I think we have to determine who's still having traditional spring breaks. Because, yeah. you know, like CU is not doing it, right? So right. they're starting back different. Yeah. There are states, though, that have dropped all their masks and everything lately. There's a couple of states that have just said, that's it, open back up. We're back to it. I had a long discussion with a guy that runs a restaurant in Tulsa, Oklahoma the other night. He has a gastro pub in Tulsa. And he said that everything that they do is completely voluntary. You're supposed to put partitions up between every table, but it's voluntary. So nobody does it. So they're just open. And, you know, so a lot of people are coming from places like that. And then they get here. If we don't warn them beforehand, like we were doing earlier on, then they are taken by surprise for the first time in you know, probably four or five months, the other night, I had three people walk in with no masks. And they were like, well, I don't understand. Why do we need a mask? We don't have masks at home. Well, how many signs did you walk through to get to me 
when I have to tell you to go out and buy a mask. So we, we just need to pump out some information again. So Lucy did put in the chat that they can totally up the educational and safety messaging um, and that they do know which colleges are on break. And right now there's no organized groups that she knows of. So we'll take a, take a harder look at that too. Okay. If everybody's okay with doing some additional messaging. Yes. Uh, anything else from COVID? Eric, what I might recommend to you is if we wanted to spend 15 minutes, uh, do any other matters or do you go through your committee reports real quickly and get that out of the way, nice then session. we can go into an exec session and we'll probably have, you know, a 15 to 20 minute break before you start the night meeting. Okay. Sounds excellent. Um, other so, matters then, gang. I have one. Yeah. Um, I, we have been hearing around town a little bit about water rates questions and why they were, you know, how much they were raised and what that means to the actual bill. And I saw the response that was given to somebody who reached out to mayor at town council, mayor and town council. Um, and I just, I didn't think it really answered the guy's question. I mean, to just say, when was, when were rates last raised last year? It's like, you know, it doesn't, I feel like it didn't give a very um, holistic view. Um, and I thought, I could definitely be wrong, but I thought when we looked at this, um, you know, a year ago or, or two years ago when we first looked at it and that we were going to raise it over the next two years, I thought there was like an actual sample um, cost that we had looked at so that we knew kind of what people were dealing with in real num in real money. And I just wondered if that's um, part of the education that we could give people who are asking. It's been on the Wellington Facebook page and I was asked personally and then we had this letter. So I know it's around, you know, I know the question is around. And I'm, I would like to put it in perspective to people because I know we had a very robust conversation about how much and is this fair and who will this impact and is it a big impact? but I didn't feel like the response we gave the man um, in writing was really enough. Um, we can, we'll certainly look at that and see. Um, I'm trying to look, I'm, I'm thinking back, which is why I'm hesitating a little bit on that discussion. I know we had a discussion when we looked at water rates and James remind me, do we have a, did we set our, rents, water rents to increase uh, by 5% for X number of years? Yeah, as it's, as it's currently set up in the pro forma, it does, it increases 5% both for residential and commercial rates each year as part of the pro forma. One thing that the last time we had this discussion was really around the water service maintenance fee. And if, for those that were on council at that time, um, we presented, um, increasing the water service maintenance fee as part of, you know, kind of an additional revenue as part of the, for the budget. Um, it's probably warrants a, you know, discussion um, in the near future to bring that back just to look at how the water rents um, compare and what those are used for. Um, and also in conjunction with the water service maintenance fee and the PIFs. Um, as, as everyone here certainly knows, we've just completed a, a big expansion to our water system. And so there's a big um, debt service to that project. In addition, we're, as everyone knows, again, we have the Goose Pasture Tarn Dam, and then we have another um, series of projects in the future to maintain and provide safe drinking water for this community. What I can say is even with the 5% increase each year as it's um, captured right now, our water is still very inexpensive in comparison to water rates in other locations. But as Rick, you know, under Rick's direction, we can certainly bring something back for council's um, council discussion if that's desired. Well, I think what, what we'll do is we, we will commit to looking at how we could craft a better response 
that explains yeah. a little more of why these things happen, the pattern of what we're doing, why we're doing it. I mean, water rates are supposed to pay for, you know, it's not about banking. It's not about making money. We don't, we're not allowed to make money off water. We pay for the services that is required. And so, uh, you know, when we increase those things, there's a reason why, and we need to make sure we're clearly articulating that. So we'll look harder at that, Kelly. A good Kelly. Thanks so much. Yep. Awesome. Other matters, other, other matters, anyone. Uh, just a heads up to anyone that's listening. We have changed our VO, uh, VRBO hotline number. Um, to, you know, I'll give the website, but it's, it's 970-423-5334. And you can get that number at townofbreckridge.com slash short term. Uh, the number just kind of went online. So, um, and we have like refrigerator magnets and stuff like that, which I'm sure will be getting to uh, concerned citizens, but uh, just to be advised, I, I don't know, if, uh, is, will the old number still work, Shannon? I don't believe so. There was a little bit of overlap between the two numbers. Um, I'll have to check because at some point that old number goes away. You know, and, you know, can they just go to the town of Breckenridge website and uh, you get kind of a, have a link to that or that they have to hit townofbreckenridge.com slash short term um i can pull it up and put it in the chat what, okay. on how they get to the website okay you've been using that number jeffrey yeah i had to knock out a neighbor it was it was erin in her new her new home <laughs> it dropped a dime on her sung like a canary surprise surprise Thanks. all right any other other matters Okay, how about uh, committee assignments, uh, creative arts, Dick or Kelly? Kelly, leave. You're on mute. <laughs> we, we uh, I've been, the finance committee has been very active, which I am on, just kind of looking at different budget scenarios, um, you know, as, as the anticipated 2021 year is changing. Um, we have, I think in a, a board meeting, the end of this week, I think for the board to approve some of that. So we can come back to you with more details at our next meeting, or actually Matt will be reporting next meeting. So hopefully he'll share some more of those details then. Uh, so that's all I have to update on BCA. All right, Kelly. Nothing to add? No. Okay. Uh, events committee? Are we good with what you already said? We, we more or less touch on anything, but again, like big thank you to Shannon, Lucy, and Todd. The whole discussion is quite the beast, and I think they framed it in a really productive way. So just thanks to them. Awesome. Uh, Heritage. DK. Yeah, that's me. Um, we have a board meeting tomorrow afternoon, being Wednesday. But the really cool thing um, is that, let's see, how does it work here? Um, Barney Ford um, is going to air on PBS February the 27th at 7 p.m. It's a 55 minute long documentary exclusively about Barney Ford and his important legacy. And in the broader context, Black Lives Matter. So if you get a chance, put that on your calendar and get a chance to look at it. Um, uh, Larissa said she saw parts of it and it was pretty spectacular. Dennis, what was that date again? Cool. It's um, February 25th at 7 p.m., Dick, and it's the okay. PBS channel. Boy, it'd be great to see, uh, to have Haley really push that out. Yeah. Bubba. I'll give her, we'll give her a call tomorrow. Will you look into getting, a, like, for those of us that don't have a TV, get a, a, a link that we can watch it on our iPad or something? Is there anything, can you do that without? It's illegal. Oh, well, I'll talk uh, to you. I'll talk to you off the record then. <laughs> Haley is commenting in the Q and A about how she's pushing it out and she's doing a live something on Instagram on Friday as well. Sweet. Great. Good, good. Awesome. That's all I've got. Uh, how about tourism? Anything to add? No, all right. Open space. 
Eat. Uh, no meetings. We're talking. Well, we will be talking about the plan some more. And also, I just wanted to note that the events are on our radar as well. Great. Uh, Child Care Advisory Committee, Kelly, or any news from the kids in your neighborhoods? Do you have one on your lap right now? <laughs> the one on your lap. No, I think we talked about child care a lot. Oh, although they were able to um, apply for some more PPP money. So, oh, sweet. Um, yeah. So they, they've they, all done that. What? Did they get it yet or are they still waiting? They don't know yet. Yeah, okay. they're waiting. I think they're just starting. I've just been hearing some people in the community are just starting to get theirs now. So, hopefully, pretty quickly. Great. Uh, social equity. Any of you we agree? have another meeting scheduled for later this week, um, but since our last council meeting, we had our listening session that Dr. Nita guided. Um, so we had a great turnout there. I think it was maybe 50 or so community members, and I know Haley uplifted that on social media. Um, but that listening session, along with the internal assessment and stakeholder interviews, the consultant's going to use to um, just provide a recommendation to town. Aaron Dick, did I miss anything? I think you did. Yeah. I think those were all the major points. Nice work. I think that was well done, Carol. Yeah, Shannon. Aaron, I did I did um, forget, but the BHA hold was on one sec, Dennis. Getting, say again. I'll hold that thought for a second. Yeah. Shannon, we're gonna add. Um just a quick thing that I've been meaning to mention, and I forgot. You can now um, view our town website in Spanish. So oh, Haley great. worked with our vendor and she got that rolled out. It's been actually probably about a month um, or so now, but we're super excited that people can take advantage of that. That's great. And I and will be tuning in at the um, diversity task force meeting just to say hello or social equity to say hello on Thursday and just say thank you to your new crew. Dennis, you were gonna add. I, I did, I forgot to tell you that the BHA did get they were successful in getting their second round of PPP money, and that was just shy of ninety thousand dollars. So, that is outstanding. Done. Excellent. Um, workforce housing. Anything to add, Jeffrey and Dick? We had a meeting today, and uh, there's some things in the uh, kind of in the works. But uh, I'll throw it to Dick. He did, hasn't got a lot of FaceTime on this meeting. <laughs> we we had some great discussions um updates um on alta verde we we had discussion on um housing helps and buy downs and um got an update on braddock um and and uh you know had a had a little discussion about maybe some some future kind of broader long-term discussions that we will bring back but that that's that's coming in the future so great good meeting excellent um i did have cast at the end of february shannon and i attended wasn't as much fun as the in-person cast meeting but there was still a lot of great discussion um you know like i said before the the uh, people from the forest service from moab and uh crested butte had really crazy how you know how overrun everybody's trails are. Crested Butte went from what used to be a truly dispersed campground model to uh, actual campgrounds. And they have, uh, he had some pictures through the years of the dispersed camp camping and how it changed the forest and just, you know, trash, I mean, trash sections of forest, just people just camping there, not necessarily even doing anything wrong. So um, it sounds like that was a pretty good move for them. Um, Rick, do you want to add some, or are you rubbing your shoulder? I'm just rubbing. <laughs> okay. I saw this. I thought, I yeah. thought the half hand up. <laughs> uh, it was a great meeting, though. You know, I, I love <laughs> listening to those guys. The guys from Whistler gave the opening presentation about what they're doing in Whistler. Um, you know, they have a totally different – they got a totally different deal than than we do compared to – you know, we're very similar to places like Park City, um, you know, obviously Vail. Whistler is a totally different animal. They're like a bunch of stuff jammed into one place. You know, they have, they have rain and snow at the same time. They're close to Vancouver. 
they get a lot of Asian visitors. So very, very different model, but it was really cool to hear. Um, that's such a great group. I'm glad we, we belong to it. And I, I feel every time I go to that, I feel like, you know, before you go, I feel like our problems are our problems. Then I go to those meetings and I feel like their problems and our problems are all the same and we're all dealing with the same exact stuff every meeting. COVID's the same and everything is the same and they're dealing with the same, you know, problem with tourists and not listening. And it, so it's very heartening for me to go to those meetings. And uh, yeah, it was great. Shannon, anything to add? No, I agree with you. I thought the Whistler presentation was great and they they really do love the queen. Um, but love the, the, queen. The, guy, the, the presenter was excellent. So yeah, it was good. That second day especially was good. Yeah, he's the, the presenter was their mayor. He's hilarious. Yeah, Jeff. One more thing. Um, uh, be nice to get ask Kaylee, and I'm sure she's doing it to push out some uh, information and suggestion about uh, availing ourselves to uh, CAIC, the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. We've had just a spate of of deaths. Utah, Colorado, you know, Opus Hut. That we I was there a year ago. Um, did you know the guy from Vail that just happened the last couple of days? No, the East Vail shoots. No, I, I didn't. I know uh, the guys from Edwards, who um, one of them was a, a friend of ours who, who, who wasn't in the uh, in the group that got, got buried. But yeah, it is just so tender out there. And the town has supported uh, CAIC in the past on our grants, and that is just money well spent. So just anyone uh, listening, be careful, and, and I'm sure Haley's pushing that out on social media. It's, she, wants, she wants to share about that right now. Haley, are you there? She was there. She was while, in the while we're there. waiting for Haley, I just echo what Jeffrey said. I, um, The high school hockey team played um, Battle Mountain Friday night, and I was over there, and one of the fathers um, that was working the other penalty box, I was in penalty box, but you know, he was part of that group on that hut trip and that, that oh. whole community is just devastating. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the snow conditions are so dangerous and, yeah. you know, let, let's all look out for each other in this community. It's, it's uh, just seeing those guys over there. It was, it was awful. Haley. Okay. Hi. Um, I was just going to share really quick that next week I have a lot planned for that. I'm also going to highlight the um, CAIC and the Colorado Mountain School are hosting a Colorado Backcountry Avalanche workshop. So I'm going to share about that um, and also highlight, um, you know, what search and rescue is suggesting that you pack in your bags. But um, I would love to include some, whoever feels comfortable, some personal stories about either experience with avalanches or, you know, I know some of you guys have had friends and stuff. So um, if you do feel comfortable sharing some of those stories, because I just think that the personal stories are really what drive it home for people, um, just shoot me an email because I'd love to incorporate that next week. That's great. Jeffrey could do a scared straight. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I kind of like I did on the D.A.R.E. program. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing, and kudos goes to uh, the Breckenridge ski area, and actually the summit, a lot of the ski areas in the summit, which, which allows uphill skinning before uh, before our operating hours. I mean, that's that's something that is truly safe, and I think a lot of people, heck, I was doing it when, when it was just really sketchy out there, you know, just get this, people getting their fix in, so... A lot of uh, a lot of the resorts across the country aren't nearly as cooperative, but in Summit County, we are really lucky about that. So thanks for that. Thanks, Jeffrey. And, and just to add to that, Jeffrey, I, I know there was a big e uh, text trail that went out um, with folks asking that that people follow the rules because uh, I guess there's a group that are are uh, not doing that and. Oh, and one more note on Avalanche, CAIC and the uh, Breck Ski Patrol are working with kids at the high school trying to get Avalanche safety um, information out, which I thought was really cool. Excellent. Uh, last thing I'll say is uh, Haley and I did Breck Buzz today. So we're back. 
Breck Buzz is back. And right. uh, I'd like Carol to do the next one and talk about the social equity committee. So your tag, you're it. Great. All right, let's, uh, anybody have anything else? So everybody got the uh, note from Shannon to log in uh, for executive session. We need to uh, make a motion first. I think Kelly's going to do that for us. Yeah, yep. I move that the town council go into executive session pursuant to paragraph 4A of section 246402 CRS relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest and paragraph 4B of section 24. 6402 CRS relating to conferences with the town attorney for purposes of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Second. Uh, motion has been made for the town council to go into an executive session pursuant to paragraph 4A of section 246402 CRS relating to the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of any real personal or other property interest. Paragraph 4B of section 246402 CRS relating to conferences with the town attorney for purposes of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Subjects of the executive session include one, the possible rental of a unit in the Breckenridge Professional Building and two, a confidential discussion with the town attorney of legal issues involved in the possible condemnation of easements required for the Goose, Tarn, pa Goose Pasture Tarn Rehabilitation Project. Roll call, please. Ms. Owen. Here. Ms. Ade? Here. Ms. Giello? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? What happened? Hey, he might have gone to exec session without us. God, Mr. rookies. Yes. Mr. Mr. Carlton? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mayor Mamula? Yes. All right. See you guys in. Uh... I'll, I'll give him a talking to. <laughs> from VTO. Hello again, Lucy. Hello again, everybody. Um, thanks for having me back. Um, still a lot of good interest in BRAC, no surprise. Um, I don't normally talk about our web stats, but we were up 136% week over week. Not that we did anything, but it had a little something to do with the snow, we're pretty sure. Um, but we are running 40% ahead year to date. Uh, just a reminder, we don't do a lot of winter marketing. Most of that is driven by the resort and the private sector. So, um, you know, we kind of wait for summer stuff for our work. Um, I wanted to just uh, hit a couple of the occupancy numbers. Um, January, we ended up just a uh, little over 8% down for the month. There was a ton of last minute fill the last two weeks, just like we saw in December, we went into the Christmas holiday and it was looking really bad. And then it filled in at the last minute. Looks like the same thing happened in January. Um, we, uh, January this year was also, it, it's always a big booking month, but this year, when you look at people who booked in January for the rest of the season, going all the way to July 31st. Like, so booking from January 15 to July 31st, we have almost a 50% increase in room nights. So keep in mind a chunk of last year, you know, from the middle of March for a couple months there, we were all, all but closed for lodging. So it's not a normal lodging year, but um, at the normal lodging comparison, but pretty significant, um, pretty positive outlook for going into uh, the rest of this season and into next summer. We are going to start looking at these comparisons back to 2019. So it will be more of a normal year comparison because we're now getting in that space. We're comparing to last year, isn't gonna make a whole lot of sense. So we'll look at it both ways. Um, we are also seeing on Jackrabbit, which is the referral system that we use on our website, um, so if somebody comes on our website, they want lodging, they go from our site over to Beaver Run or wherever. Um, people are starting to book Christmas of 21 already. So um, again, just another indicator of, of some more travel optimism out there. Uh, President's Weekend is uh, 
looking really strong. Um, it's up a little bit in room nights. Uh, it'll be about 80% occupancy, which is consistent with um, prior years. Um, but February for the month right now is still down about 13%. Um, spring break, uh, looking at the window from March 6th to April 3rd, because that's the spread of the schools that are claiming a spring break. Um, room nights are, are pretty flat to where they were this time last year. So that, that's a good sign. Um, the month right now is down 14% for the month of March. But again, that starts to get wonky because we lost the last two weeks of March last year. Um, winter, when you look at the whole season, um, we're looking at um, a decline in occupancy of about 12%, a decline in room nights of about 9% for this point in time. So I think it's pretty decent all things considered. Um, and to your, um, you know, just to go back to what, what you were talking about just before uh, you went into exec session on the messaging, we have, you know, we bring everybody into our safety kind of landing page. So everybody sees that that comes to our site, but we don't have a lot of outgoing marketing outside of the, the, um, the OTA channels. So what we can do to amplify that messaging will be to work with the lodging community and ask them to make sure that information is in the, the um, confirmation correspondence that goes out. I think that's going to be the best place to do that. So we'll get on that. Um, let's see. So we've started our summer marketing. We started that last month, just real light. Um, and we are getting ready for if we are able to move into yellow that would then change how we've been marketing in, in that we would bring people into whatever page on our website they were looking at. There'd be a little safety message, but they don't have to get stopped at the safety page. So we'll be ready for that if and when that happens. Um, we talked a lot about the resident sentiment survey um, already today, but just want to thank Carol for stepping up on the advisory committee. Basically, everybody who was on the advisory committee the last two times we've done this has re-upped again. And then we have the addition of Carol and then Ann Lowe from BOSAC. So it's a really good group. Um, we've gone through the preliminary um, conversation with our RC. They're working on the draft, which we should have here in about a week. Then that goes to the committee committee will make their comments and then um, you know we wanted it to be ready to go if, if you all decided you wanted us to put this out sooner we'd be ready to go in about three weeks but our preference is really to wait until April when things are a little bit more settled um, and we can you know we'll be including the BOSAC um, questions in that as well um, let's see a couple things from the Colorado Tourism Office they are, um, you know, they got that $2.4 million grant, um, EDU grant, and they're using that to fund a recovery roadmap. So we'll bring in a strategic um, partner to help the state figure out what's the best utilization of those funds to um, revitalize the economy. And that's going to be for urban and rural. Typically, CTO has been doing more rural stuff. But because the cities have been hit so hard with um, loss of hotel rooms and convention stuff, um, it's going to be targeted to the urban um, groups as well. And um, let's see, we're, we're doing a lot of work with the Care for Colorado, Care for Coloradoans, the, those programs, that's the Leave No Trace. We're up to 26 members in those groups. And um, Jeffrey, that's all, you know, it's the messaging about trails, it's the messaging about poop. It's a, the partnership with um, CAIC, um, Abbey Work. So that all of those things you guys were talking about earlier today, that's all getting pushed out at the state level as well. So our stuff is coming in behind that. So a lot of good, uh, a lot of good people in this group. It's really impressive. And then the last thing um, I have is just the community. Our community update is this Friday at 930. And we'll have um, Amy Wineland and Dan, Dan Hendershot both on the call. And uh, I am gonna ask them if we can have their deck in advance just so we can put that out to the people who've read. We've got um, over a hundred registered already. Um, so people can have the deck in advance so they can look at it and have questions framed for Amy and Dan 
um, on that call. So that's what we've got. Any questions or comments? Lucy, um, what's the, the, uh, the average roommates rates, the same average room rates the same or are they up or down? They're, they're up a little bit. Um, you know, uh, uh, the properties have been really good about holding rate and that's part of what's keeping the, the accommodations uh, revenues uh, and the tax collection so high. Um, part of it is, um, you know, like we've lost all, virtually all of our groups that really impacts Beaver Run and, and Vail Resorts and a couple of the bigger properties, but they're backfilling that with some FIT. They're not totally making it up, but the, the individual leisure traveler is, is generally a higher ADR than a group um, would be. So that's some of it. And, um, you know, the, uh, the large homes, well, they're really having a hard time now since they're limited to just two households. Um, you know, in the summertime, you know, they did really well. I mean, it was like the number one choice of the property. So that, that helps bring ADR up too. So ADR is, is a good story, is a positive story. And it's supply and demand, you know, people, wa people wanna come here. So um, it's good. Any other questions for Lucy? All right, Lucy, thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for everything. Okay, we have a Black History Month proclamation that I am going to read for you. Whereas this is the this is the proclamation for Black History Month, February 1st through the 28th of 2021. Whereas this is the 95th year of Black History commemoration since its week long inception in 1926 and Whereas the month of February since 1976 has been designated as a tribute to the thousands of years of black innovation and struggle and whereas in honoring black Americans from our ancestors to now we celebrate determination, hard work, intelligence and perseverance in the enhancement of all aspects of society, including business, education, politics, science, the community and the arts and whereas as we pay tribute to the heroes sung and unsung of black, his, of black American history, we recall the inner strength that sustained millions in bondage. And whereas researching black American history brings critical awareness of the many who helped build and defend our nation and of the many individuals who stood against prejudice and injustice that would inspire movements, legislation and advancements set to ensure the rights we share today and whereas Increasing our awareness of Black history, we hope to be better equipped to handle future challenges and opportunities and whereas, by the Town of Breckenridge's continued recognition of Black History Month, we hope to firmly demonstrate the respect and value we have for our residents of Black heritage. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Eric Manula, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2021 as Black History Month and call upon all Breckenridge residents to join me in supporting the aims and goals of this effort adopted on this ninth day of February, 2021. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, now we move on to first readings of new business. We start with council bill number two, series 2021. This is an ordinance amending chapter one, title nine of the Breckenridge Town Code known as the Town of Breckenridge Development Code by amending policy 24 absolute Concerning employee generation and mitigation rates, Nicole. That was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, Marion Town Council. Um, the um, the first reading of the ordinance before you is to revise a policy twenty four of R of the Development Code. Um, this revision um, is to add a fee and lieu policy and then also remove the outdoor dining requirements. Um, staff recommends that this be approved at first reading and will incorporate any revisions, um, specifically adding the 2021 acknowledgement in the calculation table at second reading. Thank you, Nicole. Any questions for staff? All right, anyone in the public wish to comment on this first reading tonight? You have 30 seconds starting now. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen.
All right, public comment is closed. Do we have a motion? On first reading, I move we pass Council Bill Number Two, Series Twenty Twenty One, the title which has been read into the record. Second. There's a motion and the second. Is there any further discussion from council? Roll we'll call, please. Helen? Ms. Giello? Yes. Mr. Carlton? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Owens? Yes. Ms. Sade? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mayor Mamula? Yes. We have a first reading of council bill number three. Council Bill 3, Series 2021. This is an ordinance authorizing the sale of town owned real property, Lot 5, Block 1, Parkway Center Subdivision, filing number one amended, also known as the Pinewood Apartments, Breckenridge, Colorado. Lori. Um, yes, um, this is the first reading of an ordinance authorizing the sale of town owned real property and that specifically is the Pinewood um, apartment land and our interest in the land lease there. Um, the attached ordinance um, would authorize the town manager to actually sign the purchase and sale agreement. Uh, you know, the terms in that purchase and sale agreement match the terms that we approved previously in a letter of intent that was signed about a year ago. Uh, specifically, there will be a deed restriction in perpetuity to ensure those units stay affordable. Um, our $1.4 million loan will be paid off. And then uh, the proceeds uh, that the town will receive will be approximately about $4.2 million from the sale. Um, as you recall, these apartments were built in 1996. Um, they've served locals um, with very affordable rental rates since then. And um, we believe that this um, agreement will ensure that they remain affordable um, in perpetuity. Um, there may be some edits to the actual purchase and sale agreement before the second reading, um, as Tim has more time to really um, look through that and send some um, comments. Um, uh, to to the seller, um, but we recommend approval on first reading. Appreciate your support. Thank you, Lori. Are there any questions for Lori? Is there anyone in the public that wishes to comment on this first reading tonight? You have 30 seconds starting now. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And with that, public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? And we pass on first reading Council Bill number three, series 2021, the title which has been read into the record. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Bergeron? Yes. Mayor Mamula? Yes. We have Council Bill Number 4, Series 2020. This is an ordinance authorizing negotiations and, if necessary, an eminent domain proceeding to acquire property interests necessary as part of the Goose Pasture Tarn Dam Rehabilitation Project, Thomas. Tim. With the Council's permission, I'll uh, speak to both the Thomas ordinance, which is in front of you now, as well as the Kramer ordinance, which will follow immediately after this ordinance. The council is aware that this spring, the uh, town is about to, will commence the uh, Goose Pasture Tarn Rehabilitation Project in the town of Blue River. We have been negotiating for certain easements that are required in connection with this project for some time. And we've been successful, um, have a as recently as this morning have obtained from one of the owners, the documents and the easements that we need. We continue to negotiate with the owners. We are hopeful that between tonight and the second reading of these two ordinances, we will be able to finalize agreements with both Mr. Thomas and the Kramers who are the subject of the other 
of the second ordinance. Uh, the reason that these ordinances are necessary is essentially a backstop position in the event that for some reason we are unable to obtain the necessary easements by negotiation. I want to reiterate that it's the position of the town that we do not want to have to go to court on an eminent domain action. It is our strong preference to negotiate acceptable agreements, but there's no assurance that that can be done until it's completed. Um, so it's my recommendation that the council uh, adopt both this ordinance and the Kramer ordinance, which is following uh, on first reading with the understanding that we will continue at staff level to try to resolve both of these matters before second reading in two weeks. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim? Any of the public wish to comment on this? Use the Q&A function, you have 30 seconds. And with that, the public hearing is closed. Is there a motion? We pass on first reading council bill number four, series 2020, the title which has been read into the record. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have council bill number five, series 2021. This is an ordinance authorizing negotiations and if necessary, an eminent domain proceeding to acquire property interests necessary as part of the Goose Pasture Tarn Dam Rehabilitation Project, Belinda Gale Kramer Revocable Trust. Mayor and council, Mayor and council it's the same um, issue that I spoke about uh, previously. I will state for the record that after the ordinance was prepared, we learned that the Kramers have taken the property out of the trust and it's now owned by the Kramer family members individually. It doesn't change anything. We still need to have this ordinance approved on first reading um, as a backstop for the uh, in the hope that we'll eventually get the document signed by the Kramers. And uh, James Phelps spoke to Mr. Kramer today. We believe this one for sure will be wrapped up successfully by second reading, but let's go ahead and adopt the ordinance anyway. Thank you, Tim. Uh, any questions for Tim? No, anyone in the public wish to comment on this? Use the Q&A function starting now. Uh, and I, I guess I'll remind uh, anyone watching that what we're trying to do if that dam breaks, it's an eight foot current of water that will run down Main Street Breckenridge and maybe get to my house. It's not getting close to your house. It's, it's going, all down. going in the basement. We're permeable. <laughs> all right, that's it for the public comment. Is there a motion? On first reading, I move we pass Council Bill Number Five, Series Twenty Twenty One, the title which has been read into the record. There is a motion, second, and a second. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we have a resolution. This is resolution number three, series 2021. This is a resolution approving an amendment to amend, to amend it and restate a promissory note. This is Breckenridge Nordic Center, LLC, Colorado Limited Liability Company. Brian. Mr. Mayor and Council, if approved, this resolution will put into effect an amendment to the Breckenridge Nordic Center loan agreement which will effectively lower the interest rate for the remainder of the term from 4% to 3%. We are suggesting approval of this resolution in an attempt to help the Breckenridge Nordic Center with the hardship they've experienced related to COVID-19 
similar to what other businesses have experienced as well. Thank you, Brian. Any questions for Brian? No, anyone in the public wish to comment on this resolution, please use the Q&A starting now. You have 30 seconds. I mean, government is tiring. You should tell jokes in these 30 second bits. <laughs> uh, I've got one. Who's that? Who said that? Oh, the, the, the accountant. That's who. Oh, Go sorry. for it. Even it's, his, even even it's, it's, up. <laughs> it's, it's germane to the, to the conversation we just had. What did the fish say when he, when he ran into a concrete wall? Damn. Uh, <laughs> Fellow comedians. Well done. All right. With that, I'm going to close the comment section, maybe permanently. Is there a motion? I move we pass resolution number three, series 2021, a resolution approving an amendment to amend and restate uh, the promissory note to the Breckenridge North Extent LLC, a Colorado limited liability company. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we do have a town project tonight for a public hearing. This is the McCain Pond Fill and Drainage Improvements. Chris Kulik will walk us through this quickly. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is essentially uh, the third installment in the Alta Verde Trilogy. And um, it's really just trying to provide full transparency to the type of um, site work we're to do associated with that workforce housing project, particularly the pond fill that is occurring on the McCain site. Um, this was contemplated during the master planning of uh, the McCain parcel, so it shouldn't be a, a huge surprise to anyone, but having said that, we wanted to make sure that, that um, it was announced to the community. And um, the, the project will also, there, there's a lot of fill that will be utilized uh, to bring the site um, out of the floodplain. This was also contemplated during the original town project hearing. Uh, most of it will be from the existing site, um, rock sifting and potentially rock crushing. Um, if there are any larger rocks uh, discovered on site uh, may need to be uh, utilized. Um, most of the fill will come from uh, where the foundations are being dug uh, for the, the building sites. So that will reduce truck traffic. Uh, for importing fill, most of the material will be from on site. So um, this was noticed um, in accordance with our town project ordinance and reviewed by uh, the planning commission last week and uh, which got uh, six votes in support of uh, approving this town project and no votes against. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, questions for staff. How long will this take, Chris? I think most of the site work is to be completed in June and July of this year, is my understanding. Other questions? Uh, does anybody in the public wish to comment on this public project? You have 30 seconds. Use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We need a big clock on the screen that jumps up when we do this. I think it'd go quicker for everybody. I usually count in my head like 1001, 1002, 1003. Where are we at right now? Uh, now you interrupt me, I gotta start over. <laughs> That's why we don't do it that way. All right, with no public comments, I will close the public comment section of this. Is there a motion? There's one at the bottom of page one, if you are so inclined. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. 
Uh, uh, you, you know what? Does anybody have it in front of them? They can read it. I'm, I'm looking at it. I just don't see where the verbiage. Oh, I have I, it, Eric. I have it. I've got it right here. I make a motion to approve the McCain Pond Fill and Drainage Improvements PL 2021-0020 located at 12965-13215-13217-13221-13250 Colorado State Highway 9 with the attached findings and conditions. Second. I'm glad I dodged that bullet. <laughs> there is a motion and a second. Any further discussion about this public project? Roll call, please. Mr. Bergeron. Yes. Mr. Carlton. Yes. Ms. Sade. Yes. Ms. Giello. Yes. Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Ms. Owens. Yes. Mayor Mamula. Yes. Uh, we do have the planning commission decisions of February 2nd, 2021. Would anybody like to ruin today's uh, <laughs> night by calling something up? Seeing none, the planning commission decisions stand as presented. Uh, that brings us to a report of town manager and staff. Anything to add, Rick? Nothing. All right. Any uh, other, other, other matters by anybody on the council? We've already done our reports. Last call for other matters. Tim, please. Eric, I would like to just follow up with the council. Council will require, will remember at the end of last year, you adopted an emergency ordinance delaying the effective date of the new model traffic code ordinance so that we could get CDOT's approval. I'm, I'm pleased to say we got that approval this week. Um, and so the new model traffic code ordinance will go into effect on March 1. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, Tim I, I made a note of that to bring that up. I should. Uh, yeah. I beat you to it, Jeffrey. All right. All right Thanks good. very much. Uh, anything else from the council or staff this evening? Thank you, everybody, for your attention and uh, smartness. We're adjourned. Good night, all. Thank you, everyone.